call this meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee to order and note for the record that a quorum is present. Our first order of business is the approval of the minutes from Tuesday, April 11, 2023. Vice Chair Edelson, do I have a motion? Uh, I move those minutes. Thank you. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. So we are back to doing our budget bills and we'll have some more of the combining to meeting up with the Senate structure and for conference committee today, as well as uh, another bill that we'll be taking up. So the first order of business is House File 717, Representative Ream. And as you make your way up, I will move that House File 717 be placed on the general register. So, welcome to the committee. Good to see you. And I know you also have an A3 amendment. Would you like me to move that amendment uh, right away to get the bill in the shape you'd like? Yes, Chair, I would like to do that. So I will move the A3 amendment. Would you briefly describe your amendment, Representative Reen? Sure, thank you, Madam Chair and members. So the amendment here is to uh, designate a seven mile stretch of Highway 5. Um, it's basically Highway 41, Trunk Highway 41, also known as Hazeltine Boulevard to um, Mitchell Road in Eden Prairie. Um, and we were very careful working with MnDOT um, and others to create a seven mile stretch. It was very important that we create a seven mile stretch here. Um, and that's, that's it. Great, so any discussion to the A3 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A3 amendment is adopted. So to your bill as amended, Representative Reem. Thank you, Madam Chair, members, dearly beloved members. <laughs> um, so I'm here to present uh, House File 717. Um, we are working to rename a seven mile stretch of what is now known as the Augie Mueller Memorial Highway. Um, and we have talked to the family members of Augie, rep, former representative Augie Mueller, who passed away in the 90s, um, worked with the family to um, create a seven mile stretch that is respectful of his history um, and his work on the highway in our area. Um, so this area, the seven mile stretch would also allow a portion of it to remain the Augie Mueller Highway um, right alongside the Arboretum, and we do have um, Jennifer Witt from MnDOT who has been working with us a lot on this bill. And if you have any further questions, she'd be great um, to detail any other information about this. Great, thank you, Representative Reem. Discussion to the bill. Representative Petersburg. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. And, and we did hear this bill in transportation, and I know originally there was some concern with the Augie Mill uh, part of the road. Uh, it sounds like uh, that has been worked out with the family because it is unusual for us to remove um, that uh, after once it's been assigned. Um, do you have any more information in regards to how the family is, is agreeable with, with that change? Representative Reem. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. Yes, we did have um, some conversations over the phone with um, a couple of the members from uh, Augie Mueller's family, and they were very supportive of, you know, designating the seven mile stretch for Prince. Um, there were no issues really. And a, a very large portion will remain at the Augie Mueller Memorial Highway. Um, I, I believe the Sibley, he was a Sibley County um, representative, so, um, but yeah, they were very respectful and very supportive of this change. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, Representative Reem, last word on your bill. Uh, well, thank you very much for the time and considering this bill. I know um, Prince was a very important figure in the musical world, but also in the state of Minnesota. Um, and we've had a number of meetings with people who are very supportive of this. Um, and like I said, we all wanted to be very supportive and respectful of uh, the late Augie Mueller, who was, in my understanding, was like um, our representative Frank Hornstein. You know, he worked with a number of farmers to work out the kinks in the road and um, did a great job. And so I, we want to continue having the name um, 
Augie Mueller Memorial Highway there, but also just have that seven mile stretch designated for prints. Great, thank you, Representative Reem. So I renew my motion that House File 717 as amended be placed on the general register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and House File 717 as amended has been placed on the general register. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is House File 1937, the Veterans and Military Affairs Budget Bill. Representative Newton. <laughs> As you make your way to the table, I will move that House File 1937 be placed on the general register. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Yeah, welcome to the committee, Representative Newton. I will also move the DE3 amendment. And um, so we also have an A4 amendment to the DE3. So the DE3 is in front of us. And then I will also move the A4 amendment to the DE3. Good. Is that, would that That's be? Correct, okay, That's correct, Chair, that, that gets bill in the order that I'd like. Them. Okay, any discussion to the A4 <laughs> amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The A4 amendment to the DE3 amendment is adopted. So do we want to take up the A5 right away or just? Okay, great. So we'll do, so if you want to speak to the DE3 as amendment, as amended, Representative Newton. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, House file 1937 as amended um, funds the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs and the Department of Military Affairs, the National Guard, as well as several other programs benefiting veterans, providing services, job training, and physical and psychological recuperation. <clears throat> The appropriations in this bill cl closely match the governor's budget proposals for uh, DVA and DMA and contain relatively few change items. Uh, overall, the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs is funded with uh, $168.5 million in direct appropriations from the general fund and uh, six million in statutory appropriations. The Department of Military Affairs, meanwhile, receives almost 49 million from the general fund, plus 4.4 million in statutory appropriations. And I'd like to mention some of the bills that we've added to what the governor had. Uh, we've added funding for Camp Bliss, which is uh, Representative Bliss's uh, proposal, uh, and it has nothing to do with, with him. It uh, happens to be the same name. Uh, Veterans on the Lake with Representative Lissigard's bill. Uh, a Veterans Resilience Project was Representative <coughs> Clardy's bill. Um, Representative Klosha, uh, excuse me, Coulter has money for the uh, Veterans Museum, the ongoing funding. Uh, Representative Greenman had funding for Every Third Saturday Project. And Representative Creshaw has Camp Ripley Museum. And then we also have from Representative Bennett the 9-11 uh, Veterans Bonus Program. So we've got, uh, it was an excellent committee. We had a lot of bipartisan support on everything that we did. Uh, there was uh, basically no controversy. And uh, I, I have to say it was really a pleasure to, to lead that uh, group of individuals. They, they were really super to work with. Um, so one of the things that we looked at in this funding that we haven't done before is we really focused on the veterans' spouses and their families to make sure that they're, uh, they're cared for as well as the veterans. Because a veteran, uh, for those of us that serve, know you, you absolutely need the support of your family if you're going to be uh, successful. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll stand for any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Representative Newton. Representative Kresha. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Representative Newton, thank you. Uh, a lot of, if not everything in this bill touches my district, from the Veteran Service Office to the cemetery and, and of course the Military Museum, which will be a statewide asset and uh, the funding for the museum. And I, I just, a, a couple of things, uh, and I, I can't thank you enough for the way you approach this. And you said in your comments, uh, it was a good committee and non-controversial. And my hat's off to you because that's just who you are. 
when you approach problems, you approach them with a solution and you look for the best pos possible and you just work with everybody involved. And I just, I mean, you're going to hear lots of it, but I just can't thank you enough for what you've done for my districts and my constituents. So happy to vote for this and thank you. Good, thank you. Representative Farr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, um, Sergeant Major. Uh, yes, sir. I, uh, I, did I see in here that the veterans bonus program that we lowered that from the, what we originally talked about, we were estimating 22 million that we needed to, to make sure that we had covered everyone down to 15 million? Yes, that's and, uh, right, Representative Fire. What we, uh, excuse me, Madam Chair. Um, we will come back if we need additional appropriations uh, that we've discussed this with the, with the department and if additional appropriations are needed, but we think that we can do it with the 15 million. Okay, I, I hadn't. Representative Farr. No, I'm doing it. No, Sorry, we Madam can't Chair. see each other yeah. either, so yeah. yeah. Uh, no, uh, I appreciate that. Um, we, you know, when, when, when we had looked at that and when I had talked to the department, I think that the number we came up with was that, so I was surprised to see the change, but, but if, yeah, if needed, we can come back with that. I will echo um, Representative Creshaw's words. I really appreciate what you've done here. Really appreciate the fact that we could bring this as a standalone bill. I think that means a lot. Um, I've literally talked to hundreds of veterans in the last couple of weeks, and, and so it, uh, it means a lot to them that we can come together and do this. So thank you very much for your work, Sergeant Major. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Fire. And, and Madam Chair, I'll say that'll cut down on a lot of emails for a lot of us as well. <laughs> Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And and to uh, Representative Newton, uh, no, I, I noticed I'm on the Housing Committee, and and we deal a lot with homelessness, and I see that you, you canceled the Veterans Homelessness Initiative dollars and put that back into the general fund, and then I think reappropriated it generally. Uh, and whereas I, I know that uh, the homeless through veterans homelessness program is probably the best uh, example of what we've done to successfully deal with with homelessness. I, I don't think we're finished yet. And so can you give me a, uh, some understanding as to why you decided to e eliminate that particular initiative and then just fund it back at, as general dollars? Representative Newton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Petersburg. I think I'm going to have to ask for some help from Ms. Roberts. Good morning, Ms. Roberts. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Um, good morning, Madam Chair members. I'm Helen Roberts from the House Fiscal Staff. And I would point you to the detailed tracking sheet. Um, if you look on line um, 100, you will see that cancellation of the $3 million, but then it is appropriated again for the same initiative. This was a department request because they were unable to spend the money. Um, and the way that we show it in the bill is just so that it doesn't count as new spending, but it is being directed back towards the same initiative. Oh, I, uh, Representative uh, Petersburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. That, that makes more sense to me. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any further discussion? Thank you. We have one more amendment to add on, which we've been adding on to all the budget bills. So I will move the adoption of the uh, A5 amendment. And this is the financial review of the grant, the grant review process. So, Representative Newton, any comments to the A5? Uh, no, uh, I, I have to say Rep Representative Hudella, who's new to the legislature, has been uh, working on this. And it, it's, really, um, it's really needed. Uh, after all the years I've spent in the legislature, I think it's a good idea. All right, so with that, we have the A5 in front of us. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails in the A5 amendment to the DE3 is adopted. So we have the DE3 as amended in front of us. Any further discussion? Last word, Representative Newton. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I look forward to uh, presenting the bill on the floor. Thank you. Great. So all those in favor of the DE3 as amended, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. And I move that House File 1937 as amended be placed on the general register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and House File 1937 as amended has been placed on the general register. Thank you, Thank Representative you. Newton. Thank you.
So the next uh, item on the agenda is House File 1723, Representative Freiburg, the Elections Bill. <coughs> And so I move that, or yes, I will move that House File 1723 be laid over. And this bill is going to be temporarily laid over until we hear the state government budget bill where they will be merged together. So we have the seven, House File 1723 in front of us. And we have the A11 amendment, which is an author's amendment. So Representative Freiburg, would you like to move the A11 amendment? Sure, I will move the A11 amendment. Great. Uh, do you want to just very quickly uh, walk through the A11? Sure. Uh, generally speaking, this amendment removes the provisions of House File 3, Representative Greenman's bill, which is being heard separately. Uh, that one is scheduled to be heard on the floor tomorrow, in fact. Um, so it removes those provisions. It reduces the appropriation amount accordingly. That's basically what it does. Any discussion to the A11 amendment? Okay, I'm sorry, I was trying to catch eyes, but so no discussion to the A11 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A11 amendment is adopted. So we have one more amendment, the A12 amendment. And so Representative Freiburg, would you like to move the A12 amendment? Sure, unless somebody else wants to. <laughs> okay, Representative but, yeah, Freiburg I can just move it. moves the A12 amendment. <laughs> Um, discussion to, well, could you briefly describe the A12 amendment as well to sure, Representative Freiburg? Uh, sure, this, uh, this amendment was a request from um, people with a higher pay grade than I have. Um, it uh, makes a redistricting change affecting Senate District 12. Um, it's, uh, it does make a pretty minor change. Uh, I believe the po projected population impact is 150 people, um, and it does not cause any of the impacted districts to violate the best practice of staying under 1% deviation from the ideal population. Um, so that's what it does. Thank you, Representative Freiburg. So discussion to the A12 amendment. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, to the author, I, I know that this was not heard in committee, that it was apparently drafted and dropped uh, last night. It is a pure policy. Uh, amendment and that's abnormal for ways and means but I also would ask that this not be engrossed into the bill we haven't had a chance to let the public talk about this we haven't had a chance for anyone to really review this some of us got phone calls last night from apparently the higher power that you were referencing uh, this is not something that I think is needed to put into this bill uh, right now and I, I just think that this should be that the public should be afforded an opportunity to look at this. Having served on the redistricting committee, uh, I can tell you that, that, that uh, and I think uh, Representative Cleborne was on that with us as well, people would call in uh, with testimony on some of the most minute aspects of redistricting, and this amendment would not really afford the public any opportunity to do that uh, here in committee today. So I would ask that uh, much like we saw yesterday, that this not be put into the bill and it be uh, given an opportunity to be discussed <laughs> more thoroughly by the public. So, Representative Freiburg. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Nash. Um, my understanding is that the appropriate place to, if we are going to make this change, the appropriate place to do so is in committee. Um, it would not be germane to do so on the floor. Um, I have spoken to leadership about this because um, I was kind of surprised to see this come up at this stage as well. Um, but uh, there is, from my understanding, there is a willingness to um, take comments. You know, I think we should put it in at this phase. There is a willingness to receive comments from the GOP side and as well as members of the public. And if there is a change uh, that can, would be amenable to everyone, we could make that on the floor. But uh, in order to be able to make that change on the floor, we need to in put this in in committee. Otherwise, it would not be germane on the floor. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And it, it, if we are to, under that paradigm, if you're going to put this in in committee today and you want the public to have the ability to comment on it today, uh, how would that happen? Because it, would, it was posted within a very small number of hours. Uh, I don't think that it's an appropriate uh, on-ramp for here. 
So I'm going to ask for a roll call on this amendment. I am. I think that this is not the appropriate place. If we are to be about process and procedure and making sure that folks have an opportunity to see everything that's going on here, particularly as it relates to redistricting, which uh, once every 10 years, if you've never served on the committee, uh, it's a it's it's an interesting um, it's, it's an interesting effort. But I think that this is right now, this is not going to be a, a bipartisan effort. And we've tried to make sure that is the case. Uh, again, we, we didn't have the chance to review this, Representative Freiberg. So I, I would uh, urge a no vote on this. So a roll call has been requested. We will do a roll call. Representative Cleborne. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I just want to say that as the vice chair of redistricting uh, last year, uh, we saw this map that was posted uh, online for a considerable amount of time. It was posted long before um, the maps were finished or that we received the maps from the court's direction. This change does not significantly change the district. It uh, is well within the guidelines and principles that uh, were posted for the redistricting committee. Uh, this was uh, seen by members of the public uh, when the Senate held, I think, one of their last hearings. This was posted. This was discussed. Um, people had an opportunity to comment, comment on it at that time. And uh, if we are going to put, if we are going to have this discussion, and there will be plenty of time to discuss it, and the bills for the state government. Um, that this will roll into are not identical from between the House and the Senate. So there will be plenty of time for the public to now see that this is being discussed and have time and conference committee to give their comments and will have plenty of opportunity to be fully vetted. And I am supportive of the amendment and I would ask our members to vote yes. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And to the bill's author, um, 12A and 12B, could you articulate to me um, where that district is? I don't have everything memorized. And if you could articulate where that district is and what two members currently hold those um, seats. Representative Freiberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Scott. It's in northwestern Minnesota. I can't identify all of the areas, but it is the current incumbent senator who is the primary one in affected by this is Senator Tory Westrom, a, a GOP member. Um, I could be wrong about the House member, but I think it might be Representative Franson um, in the House. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to the bills out there, have, have those folks, has, if, it's, if it is indeed Representative Franson, has she been consulted? Does she, is she aware of, about this amendment? Representative Freiberg. Uh, I have not spoken with her. Uh, it's possible that leadership staff has, however. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and I apologize. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding where this amendment originated and why in the 11th hour it's coming. Um, if, if someone, if the bill's author could articulate where this amendment came from and why now. Uh, Representative Freiberg, and I, I'll mention that Representative Cleavorn did talk about the history of the amendment in this originating with the Senate GOP last year. Um, is so this amendment as representative Cleavorn noted so just I don't know if you that was helpful to hear kind of the history too We can have representative Cleavorn speak a little bit more to that but representative Freiberg Yeah, uh, this uh, amendment uh, was requested by house leadership and I understand they had uh, conversations with Senate GOP leadership um, So that is where it originated and representative Cleavorn uh, chair Cleavorn's um, description of it is accurate as well It has been out there for um, approximately a year Representative Scott. Um, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, well, I, as a person that, and I think there are a lot of people around these, this table here that <clears throat> care about transparency and process, and as Representative Nash alluded to, um, there's no reason um, in my mind that, you know, the committee that oversees this can't call a, me a meeting and hear this portion and have uh, this amendment and have it... Um, appropriately posted for the public's um, consumption so that they have a way to weigh in on these changes. And we do this all the time after deadline weeks. We, 
we, we make we make exceptions for duties to meet for this exact reason. And when it's something as important as changing district lines, even if it's 150 people, it's precedent <coughs> setting. And so I, I would urge members um, to vote against this amendment, have it go through the correct process. Um, it won't take more than a day to do so. And I think it's much a much better um, way of adopting an amendment like this than doing it here and then talking about it on the House floor or in conference committee. Um, let's have the discussion ahead of time. Thank you. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, to the author, so what this particular amendment, what causes it to be a necessity that it has to be done this year rather than next year? Obviously, the election happened already last year, um, and and we know that, as you said, and as Representative Claiborne said, it's been around for a year, yet now it's just coming to us after it's been around for a year. That seems a little bit strange, and since next year we could deal with it just as easy as we can this year, that would allow us to have the committee work done that's necessary. Why can't we do that? Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Uh, Chair, uh, Representative Petersburg, there were quite a few provisions that were discussed last year. Last year ended up not being the most productive session in the world, unfortunately, and a lot of things were left undone. This is one of them. Um, I am trying to <laughs> avoid discussing individual people affected by this a whole lot, but as I said, this was uh, a request from Senate GOP leadership that and that House DFL leadership was amenable to it and um, asked this to be included in the bill. So that is why it is here. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you. I, I still am unsure as to why um, that amenability didn't occur earlier in the session uh, and, and have it done rather than now at the last minute. It does seem a little bit less transparent and seems a little bit strange and again, my question is, I'm not sure that I see any necessity that it has to be done this particular year. Uh, next year, um, in January, February, whenever we meet, uh, the bill could be run on its own and, and go through a committee and still have plenty of time for the election cycle next year. We've already gone through one election cycle with it currently the way it is without this change. And it does seem strange that we are um, pushing not only precedents, but um, uh, it seems like a lack of transparency uh, and others. Oh, it it's, seems backwards to me, and so I would highly recommend a no vote, and let's deal with it next year. I have two more people on the list. We'll go. They both have spoke twice or once already, and that's fine. We'll we'll go to Nash and then Cleveland, and then we'll go to a vote. So, Na Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, question for the author: Is this? the only correction you're going to be making uh, from a redistricting perspective, or do you envision more? Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Nash. I don't envision any more. My understanding is this is a, a one-off situation. I mean, nothing in the legislative process is certain for sure, um, but my understanding is this was um, just a one-off request to um, respond to a request from the Senate GOP. And Madam Chair. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I, I actually met with the Senate Minority Leader last night. We bumped into each other at the MPPOA, and we asked them about the, the genesis of this amendment, and they didn't know a thing about it. So um, I, I, it's a, just another reason to have some cause of concern. Uh, Senator Johnson knew nothing about this, so um, I'm not sure that this was originated by Senate GOP. Uh, so, I, again, I, I would ask that before we go to a vote that we withdraw this. It, it, it hasn't been discussed by them, wasn't requested by them, and I, I don't know why it's here. It was time-stamped yesterday at 1216, so I'm not exactly sure that that even met uh, deadlines for a committee. I, I'm not 100% sure. But, once again, this was not requested by the Senate GOP. Um, it has ample time to go back to committee to be discussed so that the public can weigh in on this and whether it was out there previously doesn't have any bearing because what happened in a previous legislative uh, session has no bearing on this current one. So again, I think this is, uh, whether it, it, it 
winds up ultimately being benign, it's all about process and there was none. So I would urge a no vote. Or if give the author one last chance to withdraw it, it, it it's just misguided. Representative Cleborn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, just a little bit of level setting here. The map that is before us was in fact drawn by the then chair of redistricting for the Senate. So I'm very surprised that that individual knows nothing of the map or its lines or its intent. I'll start with that. Secondly, the reason it's important to do this uh, amendment at this time at the is that we do redistricting every 10 years. And this current year, and the reason we're doing it in this year, which is different from doing it next year, is because we are required by statute to do a, a redistricting bill for the Met Council. We do not have a redistricting committee at this time, so therefore the Elections Committee is the appropriate venue to do this bill and to bring it forward at this time. Um, I find that um, the amendment, while it is not one that I have drafted and it is not one that I um, am asking for, it is within the guidelines of the redistricting principles that were adopted by the redistricting committee. And it is a reasonable uh, a map to bring forward. It does not harm anyone. And it is um, an appropriate time with the redistricting of the Met Council. I do not think that we should be opening up redistricting every year that we are in the legislature. So with that, I will say thank you to Representative Freiberg for carrying this and adding it to this uh, other mandated uh, redistricting requirement. Further discussion? Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And first of all, my apologies. I had a, a situation in my private sector job I took care of. So I'm stepping into this cold. I'm sorry. I thought that this was... Uh, something that had gotten figured out at a leadership level and that there was no uh, problem with this. If I, I, again, I apologize, Madam Chair, I'm walking into this cold. Is there, is there something going on that I don't know about Representative Freiberg? Representative Freiberg. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very general question, I know. Lead Garofalo, I'm as in the dark as you. I thought it was worked out at a leadership level as well. Representative Garofalo. Okay. So I just, Representative Freiberg, and if you've been asked this question already, I just, I apologize for this, but do we have your commitment that there's not going to be any redistricting changes unless there's broad-based bipartisan consensus this year? Representative Freiberg. Uh, Lead Garofalo, I'm one of 201 legislators. Um, I, I don't plan to add anything else. As far as I know, this is just a one, uh, this is just a one-off thing uh, to help a request from the Senate GOP. Um, uh, so, you know, I don't have the ability to control what the other 200 legislators do. So, um, you know, I, like, like I said, I don't have any, I don't have any ulterior motive here. This is, uh, okay. my understanding, this is just to help out the Senate GOP. Okay. So representative Ma Graffalo, Madam chair, I'm just going to like, so you understand why our side of the aisle may be a little bit, a lot of bit concerned about redistricting, um, with one sided control of government, there is this concerned that you guys are going to go out and do a re new redistricting map. Okay, that is that is what No, okay. No. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. So Repres now let's let's just Okay, yeah. so no. Representative but, Re Grappolo has And Representative Cleborn, I have the same response. Yeah. But I also have the same response to people raising income taxes when we have a 17 and a half billion dollar budget surplus. Apologies. Okay. Yep, no, it's good. It's so I just Madam Chair, I just want you to understand and my apologies I got pulled away from this. That's why this side of the aisle is worried. Stuff that we never thought would ever enter the realm of possibility is happening. We've always had a bipartisan, we always had an agreement that election laws would be bipartisan. That seems to be changing. So Representative Freiberg, that's why this side of the aisle is concerned. There's a worry that you guys are gonna tweak the redistricting map to lock in what you have now for another eight years. So if you could just say you're not gonna do it, I think it would calm people down. Representative Freiberg. <laughs> Sure, I'll, 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 take a I'll take a gamble and say that. We're not going to adopt a, a whole new redistricting map. Representative Grafton. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. 
All right, seeing no further discussion, there has been a roll call called on the A12 amendment. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Olson. Aye. Olson, aye. <laughs> Vice Chair Edelson. Lead Garofalo. Yes. Garofalo, aye. Representative Acom. Representative Egbaje. Aye. Egbaje, aye. Representative Becker Finn. Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Freiburg. Aye. Freiburg, aye. Representative Gomez. Aye. Gomez, aye. Representative Hassan. Aye. Hassan, aye. Representative Heinzman. Pass. Heinzman abstain. Representative Hornstein. Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Howard. Aye. Howard, aye. Representative Cleborne. Aye. Cleborne, aye. Representative Creshaw. Creshaw, aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly. Representative Moeller. Aye. Moeller, aye. Representative Nash. No. Nash, no. Representative Noor. Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Novotny. No. Novotny, no. Representative O'Neill is excused. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative Petersburg. No. Petersburg, no. Representative Farr. No. Farr, no. Representative Pinto. Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Schumacher. No. Schumacher, no. <clears throat> Representative Scott. No. Scott, no. Representative Ewakim. Aye. Ewakim, aye. Uh, Representative Acom. Representative Lilly. And Representative O'Neill is excused. Right. Madam Chair, there are 17 ayes, six nays, and three, or I'm sorry, one abstain and two excused. On a vote of 17 ayes and six nays, the motion prevails and the A12 amendment is adopted. So to your bill as amended, Representative Freiburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I was hoping this bill would feature all of the uh, bipartisan solidarity that the previous bill featured, and we're off to a great start. <laughs> um, so this bill contains many policy provisions that I'm proud of, but given that this is the budget committee, I will focus on the budget provisions. In brief, this bill funds the Office of the Secretary of State and the Campaign Finance Board. So we heard testimony from the director of our Campaign Finance Board and committee about the desperate straits our public financing system is in. Specifically, he said that our public financing system is, quote, dying on the vine, unquote. More and more candidates are bypassing our public financing system, even though public financing is a surefire way to reduce the influence of special interests in our elections. So this bill will create, uh, will increase the public subsidy statutory appropriation by just under $3 million in fiscal year 2025. We heard from our cities and counties about the need to have a sustainable source of funding for election infrastructure and other election purposes. So this bill sets up a new a Voting Operations, Technology and Election Resources, or Voter Fund. Um, it allocates $2.6 million over the biennium to this fund. Um, it includes several other budget provisions, including the state match under the Help America Vote Act, the redistricting litigation fees and costs related to a couple of bills, such as the early voting bill, and a bill related to lobbying political subdivisions. Um, seeing as we had one of the smaller budget targets um, of the different committees out there, and this is the budget committee, I think maybe I'll just keep my comments short, um, but I'm happy to stand for any questions, and I know um, House Research and Fiscal Analysts are here to answer technical questions as well. Thank you, Representative Freiburg. Discussion to the bill as amended. Discussion to the bill as amended. Okay, seeing no further discussion, any final comments, Representative Freiburg? This bill protects our election workers, makes voting, vo voting more accessible, and provides clarity on who is funding our elections. I think it's a great bill, and um, I encourage members to support it when that moment comes, which is not now because it is just being laid over. That's correct, <laughs> Representative Freiburg. So with that, House File 1723 is laid over. Thank you. And so the next bill up is House File 1830, Representative Cleavorn, the State Government Budget Bill. Hello, Representative Cleavorn. Representative Cleavorn moves that House File 1830 be placed on the General Register. 
and the only amendment we have to adopt is the A5 amendment. So we'll go ahead and just do that now and then you can describe the bill. So the A5 amendment is a grant management amendment and Representative Cleavorn moves the A5 amendment. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A5 amendment, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A5 amendment is adopted. So to your bill as amended, Representative Cleavorn. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members today before us, we have a bill that reflects the important work of the state and local governments and our responsibility to the people of Minnesota. This is a very good bill. Uh, it reflects a balanced approach to meeting the needs of our government to serve the people of Minnesota. The jurisdiction of this bill is broad. It pertains to the constitutional officers, the legislature, over 30 agencies, um, and then what I call the big four, management and budget, Minnesota IT, the Department of Revenue, and the Department of, Minister of Administration. These entities are the foundation on which good and responsible self-governance is built. This bill restores part of the capacity of our state government to carry out the work of governance and to manage with the appropriate staffing levels. And um, with that, I would just like to walk through some of the provisions of the bill. Um, in the uh, legislature, there are important pieces that have been added in addition to the funding of the legislature itself. There is a legislative task force on aging. Uh, we are adding translation services, and there is an advisory uh, task force on infrastructure. Moving on to the Office of, governor, of the Governor, there is an addition of the Office of Tribal Relations, which is an important uh, office to help address the disparities between the Native and non-Native peoples of Minnesota. At the State Office of the Auditor, there are important provisions that will allow for technology staffing, a township specialist, grants to help our um, townships with the accounting systems that they need to use in being able to report on time. There's also a provision for regulatory compliance and an oversight dashboard, which will help our townships do the work that they need to do and have a one-stop place to go. There are also electronic auditing tools, which are provided for uh, in that budget. In the Office of the Attorney General, there is a significant investment on staffing and creation of new resources to deal with antitrust efforts. And also this funding will go hand in hand with the enhanced criminal prosecution funding that we brought forward earlier this year. For the Secretary of State, there, this bill provides additional funding for the Safe at Home program, which provides secure and confidential mailing addresses for targets of domestic abuse and other forms of violence. There is also a provision which will add greater physical security to the Secretary of State's office, and uh, additional funding, I believe, is also provided for our small for our business registration part. Minnesota IT has a substantial investment in this bill, and uh, Minnesota IT is receiving the significant funding to upgrade uh, the growing role of integrating our state agencies and the increasing demands of cybersecurity. The bill also provides local cybersecurity grants, enterprise-wide cloud transition, and more accessible digital technology across our state systems. The Department of Administration, which supports a wide variety of state agencies and nonprofits, this bill has a significant focus on how grants management and grants oversight will be provided for going forward. And I'm very excited about those initiatives. It also has um, a bill in here for feasibility study of creating a statewide grants management system so that there's a one, a one system for us to be able to see across all of the agencies what is happening. There are additional appropriations for public television, for AMPERS funding, and for our state archaeologist and demographer. In management and budget, uh, this is the central service agency uh, it's serving the governor, the legislature, and 100 state government entities with a workforce of over 56,000 employees and serving, serving the public. This will help modernize state government and our state workforce, including staffing, auditing, accountability, and there's a wonderful provision in here that helps us retain uh, our employees with disabilities. And I thank Representative Breyer for bringing that bill forward. Moving on to the Department of Revenue, uh, there are um, just maintenance of current uh, 
programs that are provided, but it, these extra resources will help them continue to provide the excellent service that they do statewide. And um, there, as I mentioned earlier, there are cybersecurity grant programs, Representative Newton's bill for upgrades to the roof for the um, Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission uh, complexes in here. There is Representative Freiberg's bill for flag redesign, redesign commission, and young people are really excited about that, to have a flag and a, a seal that supports our state as it is today. I also would like to uh, highlight the market bucks, which is now called healthy eating here at home, uh, provision which is in the bill with a significant increase. Uh, Representative Jordan's bill, which would provide uh, a hazard assessment for the St. Anthony Falls. And that's a really important project for the safety of our state. Um, in here, there is also a provision which would provide a statutory appropriation for the legislature. Um, let's see. Let's see. I'm trying to think. I don't want to repeat myself. Oh, I would also like to highlight uh, Representative Freiberg's bill on land survey monuments. This is really important when it comes to property rights in our state. There are also the Private Cemeteries Act has been updated, which uh, amends the laws of how we identify, treat, and handle burial sites and cemeteries in our states and what makes it clear what may not be disturbed. Um, let's see. There is an update for the CAP board for the 30-year-old plan for the capital area design framework. And the bill goes on and on. So I will leave it at that, and I will be happy to answer your questions. It's really a good, good bill for moving state government forward and helping state government serve the people of Minnesota. Thank you, Representative Cleveland. Discussion to the bill. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I serve as the Republican lead on this committee, and I, I do thank Chair Cleavorn for uh, so a lot of the work that we got done together. Yeah. Um, I will say that the investment in Minute is an appropriate one, that we have uh, come a long way since I got here nine years ago when Minute was uh, the punchline to a bad joke, and it's come a long way, and we do need to make investments in uh, our state's infrastructure. But I will point out that there are tremendous increases over the base. Uh, some of the highlights are the governor's office has 154% over last year's base, attorney general 45%, uh, MMB 64%. And I think that this is emblematic of a lot of the things that we've been seeing this session that uh, we are uh, we are spending a lot of money that uh, would be best served to be back in people's pockets. But uh, you've heard me say this quote before, and, and I guarantee you'll get to hear it again. But uh, the bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. But that's exactly what's happening here, is that the bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the bureaucracy. Uh, the chair and I have, have had uh, good moments together, and we've, we've had moments of contention. Uh, we'll save the latter for the floor, but uh, not here in committee. Uh, there's just a lot of growth here that I don't think is particularly warranted. Um, and I, I just think that putting this much money into the bill for organizations that, in my estimation, also need massive reform before they get any more money, uh, we could have done that better. But I will also say that I, I appreciate the chair and some of the things that she has uh, had me or allowed me to put into the bill. Uh, there are some, some minor tweaks to minute language that will provide some oversight for cloud computing. Uh, but overall, this is a, a very spendy bill. And I, I once again, I can't support it, Madam Chair. But it, it does have some things in there that I would support. Um, if if it wasn't uh, laden with other things in other places. So uh, I would encourage a no vote on this, but uh, uh, maybe we can continue to work together and have some amazing DEs on the floor for uh, some cuts in spending. But thank you. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, to the bill's author, Representative Cleavorn, I, I echo what um, Representative Nash said about it, minute. Um, you know, we have some very archaic systems within the government, and um, that is one thing I'm not opposed to improving upon. Mm -hmm. um, but with all the increases in these different budget line items, I'm wondering um, how many new FTEs are being created with this new budget that you're proposing? 
Representative Cleborn. Um, Madam Chair, there are approximately 158. 150. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. So 158 uh, new new employees. And do you, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, Representative Cleaver, do you have a breakdown of somewhere, a, a document that you can provide the committee um, and the full body actually on, on where those 158 new employees will be um, according to the budget items? Representative Cleavorn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have gone through this. Um, I'll just quickly give you an overview. So MMB will have approximately 50. Um, the Attorney General will have approximately 32. And that's almost evenly split between legal, non-legal, and always keep in mind that there are IT folks in all of these numbers. The Auditor will have 11. Revenue will have zero. The Secretary of State will have seven. Minute will have 13. And administration, oh, I just have their total number, sorry. I don't have their individual one written down. Um, what I would like to say to you though, is that when you look at the level of FTEs that are included, the 158 that I mentioned, this still does not get us where we would have been from uh, about 2003. We've had 20 years of disinvestment and cuts. So even though it seems like a lot of employees to you at this moment, um, we are still far behind the staffing levels that we would have had at some time, at some time ago. So thank you. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Th thank you for being prepared for committee and having those answers. I appreciate that. If you could get back on the admin number mm -hmm. eventually, that'd be great. Representative Cleborn, I do have a question. Um, the governor's office is getting 154% increase. Could you um, kind of give me an explanation for that? Representative Cleborn. Thank you, and it's a really great question because uh, statistics can often be deceiving. And so what is happening is they're going to a direct appropriation, which is much more transparent for the public to be able to see what it actually costs to run the governor's office, as opposed to billing agencies for the work that they do. So in, in addition to seeing that increase there, you will also see that there is a provision for cuts for the agencies so that those costs are actually offset. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And so the admin number that you're going to provide for us, with 154% increase, is the governor's office going to be adding FTEs then? Um, and would that fall under the admin FTE number? Representative Cleavorn. Thank you very much. Let me just pull that back up, and I apologize. I didn't give that to you earlier. So I believe that the governor's office has a net increase of 10. I believe it's a net increase of 10. And I can get you those exact numbers. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative Cleborn. Yes, it is 10. I, I found it. It is 10. Okay. Thank you. And um, so with all the new IT that we're going to be getting, won't there be some efficiencies that will be realized and therefore you'd actually need fewer employees? Would that be um, something that would be a logical conclusion to draw? Representative Cleavorn. Thank you, and uh, Representative Scott, I think that is something that we will be looking forward to, and it's part of what Lee Nash was talking about earlier and asking for some additional reporting. He's uh, looking to see where efficiencies will be created and how they'll be created. And in some of the uh, lines that are listed for full-time employees, I don't, couldn't tell you, I'll have to go back to my book to look, but there is a decrease in the number of employees. So it starts off with a higher number and then drops to a lower number. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and final question. Um, Representative Cleborn, so um, in light of what you just explained to me, is it, so when this bill reaches the floor, would that reporting mechanism, um, could that be something in the form of um, an amendment that would be acceptable to you so that we can look at um, these efficiencies um, once the new IT systems or the new IT um, yeah, systems are in place. Is that something that you would be um, agreeable to if, if an amendment was offered to put that kind of requirement in the bill? Thank you. Representative Cleveland. Have you been speaking to my lead, Nash, on this one? No. I Lead Nash is currently working with Minute to see what kind of appropriate reporting would be there and available. And always, 
the devil is in the details. I will not commit to supporting any amendment until I actually see the final words. Thank you, Madam Chair. Further discussion to the bill? Lead Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Cleborn, I'm focusing on the, on the spreadsheets yes. on the first three pages we have. Which, uh, <clears throat> which line item contains the governor's new lake home? <laughs> which, uh, which item is that on here? Representative Cleborn. Thank you. I'm really disappointed, um, Lead Garofalo, that you didn't watch the state government committee meeting when we said, um, I, don't, I don't discuss that issue. <laughs> And it's no longer a lake home. I think the Republican donor is keeping their home. Representative Graffel. The Republican donor is what? It's the the home is uh, the as I understand it from reading the Star Tribune. I've had no conversations with the governor or with admin about it. Uh, I understand that the original home that was located was the home for rent of an, a large Republican donor. But I that's just what I read in the Star Tribune. I have no idea. Representative Graffel. <laughs> You mean Mike McFadden, the candidate for Senate? I have no idea whose home it was. Yes. Yeah. Representative okay. Graffel. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Cleborn. So the, there was a budget item in there for, uh, they had signed an agreement to lease that home on the lake, and Sunfish Lake for- It's my understanding- oh. Representative Cleborn. Thank you. It's my understanding that the that that home is no longer the home that will be leased. Uh, it's my understanding from the Star Tribune that there's another home that will be leased, okay. or for some news outlet. Representative Grappel. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Cleborn. Um, you know, my home in Farmington is available for the governor if he wants to raise, <laughs> it, raise uh, if he wants to rent it out for is it eighteen thousand a month, seventeen thousand. So we can do that. Um, if you just want to run that up the food chain, maybe that's an option. So on uh, page three of the spreadsheet here, would you please tell me which spreadsheet you're looking at? There are three. The House, State, and Local Government Policy and Finance General Fund Summary Direct and Open Appropriation Spreadsheet. So this is the one. <laughs> Um, there's uh, pages one through three of 26. Yes, okay. And so we have a, um, halfway over to the side there, we have dollars from base, percentage from base. Yes. And when we go to page three, line 118, we see a 41% uh, increase in net general fund spending for this area. Uh, in your comments, you described your bill as balanced. My question is, in light of a 41% increase, uh, when you say balanced, balanced against what? Representative Cleborn. Thank you very much. And uh, Lead Garofalo, I would also like you to look at um, line 111. So in the first year, you will see that it's very much front loaded. And that has a lot to do with the infrastructure investments in IT across all of our systems. So you'll see that that uh, base number is much larger at 41%. But if you go to the second and the base of the 200 million, you'll see that it's only an 18% increase. So yes, it, there is a lot of upfront spending in this bill, one-time spending. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members. And just to be clear, we're looking at, uh, as we're on line 118, mm -hmm. you see our February base is $1.1 billion. And as we scroll over to the uh, both the governor's recommendation and then the recommendations in House File 1830, mm -hmm. even if we subtract the uh, the men IT expenses, uh, we're seeing a pretty robust expansion in government spending. And so my my question is, you described your bill as being balanced. Yes. And I just wanted to know what it's balanced against. Um, we see uh, more spending. We see additional government growth. Mm -hmm. um, what is that balanced against? Against what are the what are the trade-offs that show fiscal restraint in this committee? Representative Cleborn. Thank you, Lead Garofalo. It's balanced against the needs of Minnesotans. Minnesotans deserve to have their data protected no matter which agency that they're in. Um, we have um, systems, payroll systems, HR systems, um, all of our IT is being held together with bubble gum, twine, paperclip. And it really needs the investments that you see in this bill. The state demographer needs to be able to collect data quickly. Um, when we're talking about uh, making sure that we have monuments that will protect people's property rights, um, it, it, it is balanced against the needs that Minnesota 
citizens have and the services that they expect from their government. And it is balanced against um, making sure that the applications that they use to access government are simple and easy to use, whether they're using their phone, their iPad, or a computer. The systems that we currently have, you know, it might take people an hour to get through an application to apply for services, where we have seen when we are able to meet users where they are with appropriate IT interface, mm -hmm. then they can do that work in 15 minutes, 25 minutes, and they're done. So when you balance it against the needs and time of our citizens, I think it's a great bill. Representative Gruffalo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Cleborn, you made the case for why um, mm -hmm. the bill is big. I'm asking what's on the other side of the equation. What's the, what's the balance that shows restraint? Representative Cleborn. Well, restraint is always in the eye of the beholder. Whenever we can save a Minnesotan time, that is something that uh, is a good thing. So the savings may not be in dollars. The savings may be in their time, effort, and satisfaction with the interface with government. Representative Grafbo. Thank you. Uh, last question. Uh, Representative Cleborn, does this meet all the, does this meet the needs of the State Government Finance Committee? or will we require additional need spending in the future? Representative Cleborne. Are you offering to open your wallet? No, Madam Chair, I'm not. Representative okay. Cleborne, I'm serious. If you look at your bill, um, you're projecting that you're gonna have a state government finance bill that goes from 1.5 billion mm -hmm. down to 1.3 billion? Yes. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that. So are there unmet needs out there after the passage of this bill that will that you see need to be addressed. Representative Cleborne. As with all of the work that I do at the legislature, I let the community drive that work. If there are needs that the public comes to us that says need to be addressed, then I think we should listen to that conversation and address those needs as they're brought forward. Representative Grafalo. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, as we know from, our, uh, from the data of our economic forecast, we have GDP growth projected to be around 2%. Minnesota's population is flatlined and we're seeing a 41% increase in state government finance spending. Um, this is the definition of unsustainability. Um, and it's not an accident, it's being done by design. Thank you, Madam Chair. Further discussion, Representative Petersburg. Um, uh, thank you, and I just would just reiterate some words that we use, and, and I apologize for talking after uh, Representative Garofalo, but uh, I heard the Chair Claver and talk about disinvestment over the last 20 years. And, and I don't think that we ought to consider disinvestment when we have uh, a lessening of, of staff or even plateauing of staff or reduction in cost. All of us would like to increase our, our standard of living and we do that through increased productivity, meaning we do more with less. And I don't think that should mean that this disinvesting and that we're actually providing less service to the public just because for heaven's sake, government can do it cheaper. Uh, that's not the point. The point is that we ha oftentimes should be expecting, as, as citizens, should be expecting the government should become more and more efficient with providing the services to us, not just saying, well, we're gonna throw more money at it because that's easiest. Uh, this is a time for us to actually challenge ourselves, and I, I don't think we ought to be using the word disinvestment just because we have decided that we could do it cheaper or better with less people. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, I'll go to Representative Cleavorn for the final word on her bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And I would like to begin with a thank you. Uh, I would like to thank all of our excellent staff who've helped put this bill together and um, the state employees who have provided the information and input for this bill um, in their hard work. And I would also like to thank Lee Nash um, he and I have not always agreed on everything, but we have had a good working relationship. So I would say thank you to him. And with that, members, it's a great bill. It goes a long way to helping uh, bring our systems back to where they need to be. And I ask for your yes vote. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cleavorn. So we'll do a series of motions now to merge the state government and elections budget bills. So, Representative Freiberg, would you move that the language contained in House File 1723 as amended be incorporated into the state government and elections budget bill as separate articles? So moved. 
Any discussion to the motion before us? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion is adopted. Representative Cleveborn, would you move that the language in House File 1830 as amended be incorporated into the state government and elections budget bill as separate articles? So moved. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 So now we have the two bills, the motion prevails and we have the two bills merged. So Representative <coughs> Cleavorn renews her motion that House File 1830 as amended be placed on the general register and that nonpartisan staff be directed to make technical changes as necessary. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Cleavorn. And so the last bill on the agenda for today is House File 2887, Representative Hornstein, the Transportation Finance and Policy Budget Bill. Um, the largest net migration is bureaucrats after they just got rewarded. So Representative Hornstein, good to see you. And you, Representative Hornstein moves that House File 2887 be placed on the general register. So would you like to walk through the bill and then take up amendments or take up amendments? We have a, I think it's four amendments. Would you, I defer to you on how you'd like to handle that. Um, Madam Chair, uh, we could maybe do the, amend, uh, walk through the bill and then um, we can do the amendments. Uh, once people have a little bit more context for uh, what we're doing. That sounds great. So why don't you proceed then, Representative Hornstein? Well, thank you, members. Um, and, and thank you, Madam Chair, for hearing uh, House Hall 2887. That is the 2023-2024 uh, Biennial Transportation Budget Bill. And um, just to review, um, our committee has jurisdiction over uh, MnDOT, uh, the Metropolitan Council, and the um, uh, Department of Public Safety's uh, transportation-related uh, budget and uh, accounts. Um, these include uh, driver and vehicle services, Office of, uh, uh, Office of Safety, um, transportation safety, pipeline safety, and the State Patrol, among others. And so, um, uh, the budget here uh, is really responding to some very, very significant uh, needs in the transportation arena that have piled up over many years. Uh, and so I'll just uh, start by saying that uh, our committee examined those needs very early on in the process in January. And when MnDOT uh, came, they um, noted that uh, by the year 2030, 10% of our roads in the state of Minnesota will be in poor condition. So think about that. Uh, when we are traveling our roads today, uh, we see many, many uh, problems, particularly you know, now the pothole issue has sprung up again. Uh, this is a, certainly a function of the normal freeze-thaw cycle, and um, uh, it is uh, you know, the result of a, of a particularly rough winter. Uh, but imagine this goes beyond the normal freeze-thaw cycle members. We're talking about 10% of our roads in a short seven-year span will be looking a lot like the roads we're driving today. That is unacceptable. That is unacceptable to promote our economy. That is unacceptable for safety. Uh, that is uh, unacceptable uh, for our quality of life. And so this bill makes substantial investments to improve our road and bridge infrastructure. Um, the Association of Civil Engineers uh, put out a report card recently, which rated Minnesota's roads, uh, gave it a grade of D plus. Our transit systems a C minus, our bridges a C. So the last time that we had a significant bill to pro provide new revenue into the system, was in 2008. Uh, there was a bipartisan override of Governor Pawlenty's veto of the then transportation bill that was authored by uh, uh, my mentor, Representative Bernie Leader of Blessed Memory. 
Uh, and that was a modest increase uh, in the gas tax and a metro sales tax. Um, very much uh, compromised from the original version. Before that, the only other time we had new revenue was in the 1990s. So this is why we have these incredible needs that have piled up over many years. And the many projects that members from both sides of the aisle would like to see in their districts, they don't go away, they just get more expensive. So now is the time for a very significant investment in our transportation system to catch up with all of these cascading needs. And so let's start in terms of the, the finances in this bill. The general fund uh, target we received uh, was $1,075,000,000, million, one-time money. Keep in mind that one-time money, while welcome and important, doesn't address these long-term needs. Transportation, unlike other budget areas, is reliant on dedicated funding. And so we don't normally have general fund money, although we will have some in the future, thanks to Representative Petersburg's bill, which I'll talk about in a minute. But this $1 billion plus one-time money, three quarters of it goes for two very significant uh, areas where we are matching historic levels of federal money that were passed in the uh, IIJA bill. That was the Federal Infrastructure, Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, passed and signed into law in November of 2021. The most significant federal investment in public infrastructure since the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System. <clears throat> Some problems with the Interstate Highway System, but nonetheless, uh, that was the last significant federal investment uh, on par with what we had in, in 2021. Uh, and then um, this, the one prior to that was the New Deal. So members, you've got the New Deal, you've got the Eisenhower investment in interstate highway system, and you have the I, bipartisan IIJA bill passed in November 21. To access that federal money in Minnesota, we need to invest state money to access that federal money. So $554 million in this bill go for a federal match. We'll be getting $7.8 billion uh, out of that, and that will go for roads and bridges and some electric vehicle infrastructure as well. And we are providing technical assistance to local governments in this bill so they can write the grants to access that money. Uh, thanks to Representative Cagle's work in the uh, Sustainable Infrastructure Committee. Uh, secondly, we have uh, the second major investment in the uh, uh, general fund allocation is the NLX train to Duluth, uh, where we are going to be accessing hundreds of millions of dollars of federal money uh, to complete that line. Um, and uh, so we have an allocation of one-time general fund money for that. Other items are, are mainly for agencies and uh, uh, keeping up with some of their needs, some new initiatives, for example, and uh, traffic safety. Uh, we have had uh, record numbers of fatalities in recent years on our roadways. Safety is a very key part of this bill. So now let's get to the new revenue. Um, those of you who have been on this committee in the past, uh, there are some familiar items. Uh, in terms of our revenue raisers, but some new and, and different and I think significant ways in which we're raising money. So to the familiar items, um, we have a, a tab fee, license tab fee increase, uh, and that goes exclusively to roads and bridges. We do not have a gas tax this year. We had one in 2019 and in 2021. We're going a different direction because the gas tax is a declining source of revenue, and we want to look at something that has potential for the future, that is new, that is innovative. And we have a delivery fee on products that are delivered to people's uh, homes, uh, 75 cents per delivery. Uh, thanks to Representative Cagle, who's worked very, very hard on that bill, has addressed a number of the uh, concerns that uh, interested parties have had with this. Uh, that bill will not be implemented for uh, a, a while. Uh, I think it's, uh, Representative Cagle can correct me, but we have a delay in uh, implementation of that so that we can work 
some of the uh, other issues out, and we have an amendment related to that as well. Um, we have a metro sales tax, uh, which is higher than we've had before. We've had a half cent metro sales tax in this committee. It's a three quarter cent uh, sales tax now. Half of that new increment goes to roads and bridges in the seven county metro area. And then the other um, eighth, additional eighth of a cent goes, will we'll fund some of the new programs that we are looking at, new transit projects uh, that we're looking at, future looking transit, future facing transit projects that we are list in the bill. Things like micro transit, how do we get that last mile uh, after someone has taken public transportation, how do we get them to their final destination over that last mile or two? The southern suburbs have pioneered this micro transit uh, program which we are funding in this bill and we'll, we'll have an amendment with some specific amounts later. Arterial bus rapid transit, shoring up the local bus system. These are some of the things that our metro sales tax will use. We can make no better investment to address climate change and equity than investments in public transportation. Nothing lifts people out of poverty better than access to jobs. We had someone at a public hearing say, what good is a job if you can't get there? This investment will help in that. Um, finally, we have um, uh, an adjustment. We've had this in the bill in the past. Uh, the sales tax for cars uh, is lower than the sales tax for other products or other, other items that people purchase. Uh, so we raised that from 6.5% to 6.875% for uh, purchase of a new car. That also goes to roads and bridges uh, as well as uh, greater Minnesota transit in this bill. So those are the major features uh, uh, in terms of the finances uh, of this bill. Um, and I would be uh, happy to, I, I know uh, Madam Chair, if you'd like to um, uh, answer and uh, have me answer questions or if you wanna take the amendments now, I'm, I'm open to however you would like to proceed with the committee. Okay, great. Thank you, Representative Hornstein. I think we'll do the amendments and then we'll move to member discussion after we have the amendments. So the first amendment I have here is the A32. Okay, and so thank you. Thank you, you very much, Madam Chair. A32. So this, <clears throat> yes. this um, relates to actually a bill that I introduced, House File 2700. Uh, we did have some specific amounts for uh, micro transit uh, in that bill. Um, but uh, uh, we now have identified, I think, more clearly the funding source will, will not be general fund, but uh, from the Metro sales tax. And so we're putting those specific amounts back in. Uh, and so we give money to Minnesota Valley Transit um, and Southwest Transit uh, uh, for this um, new micro transit program that will build out, again, those last couple of miles. The Southwest suburbs, uh, Southern and West Southwest suburbs have done really, I think, national level work in, in pioneering this new uh, transit mode. And this is what this goes for. And it just clarifies some earlier work we did in the committee. So I'd ask for your support. I'd, I'd, so I'd move that uh, A32 amendment. The A discussion to the A32 amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say no. 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 The motion prevails and the A32 amendment is adopted. Now on to the A33 amendment. Representative Hornstein, would you like, <coughs> excuse me, move the A A33 amendment? So thank you, Madam uh, Chair and members. As I mentioned, um, you know, we climate is a very important piece of this bill. Um, transportation is the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Representative Kraft has uh, introduced the bill that we've heard uh, and he has continued to work with different interested parties uh, as the processes move forward. And this amendment uh, is a result of his work with MnDOT uh, on um, uh, how, how the greenhouse gas emissions will be uh, assessed in, in the bill. Uh, I appreciate again Representative Kraft's ongoing work. Uh, he's here to answer questions, but I I believe, again, we, we heard this bill very thoroughly in our committee as well as in state government. And Representative Kraft is now trying to uh, finalize some of the uh, uh, agreements he's made with different interested parties. Thank you, Representative Hornstein. So the A33 amendment discussion, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, Representative Hornstein, um, this amendment, so is it going to measure um, um, over a period of time how much greenhouse gas emissions have either increased or decreased? Is that what this amendment is intended to do? Well, thank you. Bernstein. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Scott. Yes, uh, what, what we're doing in the, the broader underlying bill that's uh, included in this, um, uh, in, in House File 2887, is to find ways in which we can plan communities and uh, transportation projects in a way that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't know how greenhouse gas emissions technically, I don't know how they're exactly measured. I'm not an expert on that. But let's say that there's no marked decrease in greenhouse gas emissions after 10 years of all these new policies and different things that are happening in the transportation bill. Uh, what then? Representative Hornstein. Well, thank you. That's an excellent question, um, Madam Chair and Representative Scott. Uh, you know, I think the experience we've had uh, over the years uh, and studies that have been done, that if we um, address this issue by changes in land use, which is um, the, the point to represent Kraft's underlying bill, by much more um, uh, people adopting and, and, and looking at uh, uh, public transit and active transportation options, and al also adoption of electric vehicles. If we do those three things, we'll, we will have a significant drop in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, there, there could be reasons why that strategy won't succeed, but you know what? Uh, that is the evidence. That is the evidence, and it makes common sense that if you're using a transportation system that emits less, uh, you're going to have less greenhouse gas emissions. And if we're going to make an impact on climate, <clears throat> we've done a good job through the 100% bill, uh, other activities we've done uh, in the electric utility section, buildings, for example. We heard a lot from um, uh, uh, Representative Acom's excellent bill that we heard yesterday on buildings. But we haven't really done the work on transportation. And that is the number one source. So I'm very, very confident that uh, this bill will make a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Minnesota. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Hornstein, I'm not sure I heard an answer in there. What if... The answer no is yes, we will reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in this bill. Representative Scott. M Madam Chair, that wasn't my question, Representative Hornstein. Well, my I'll question was, if after we do all these things and invest all these taxpayer dollars in making all these changes, if after all of this, there's not a measurable decrease in greenhouse gases, what, what then? Representative Hornstein. Well, we're going to have to, you know, I, that, that's a, a theoretical question. And I, I guess what I would answer is that we would have to really redouble our efforts to find out, you know, what, what strategies work, what strategies don't work, and, and do them. Because really we... Uh, the scientists tell us we have very little time uh, to avert, I think, a very major, uh, uh, we're already in a climate crisis, but it, it is growing, it is deepening, it is expanding, and I, I think your 10-year time frame, Representative Scott, is a, is a good one. I mean, I think we should assess this in 10 years. Um, but we would have to really, um, I think, evaluate, analyze, uh, again, what strategies have been working, what haven't, and then redouble our efforts to to, to get this work done because it is absolutely critical uh, for our planet. And I will say that um, uh, when we address climate change, we're also, there's a, a fiscal piece to this too. Billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, are spent mitigating uh, the impacts of climate change. So from a fiscal standpoint, we're in a fiscal committee, uh, we really better uh, get our arms around this. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And to this, uh, Mr. Chair, do you believe that this um, that this assessment, impact assessment, will have veto power over a particular project? In other words, if if it says it's uh, uh, it's going to pr produce a little bit more or or the same amount of greenhouse gases, that then it would be able to uh, derail a particular project. Um, Madam, Madam Chair and Representative Petersburg, I think the idea here, and this is what Representative Kraft has, has been working through with it, the interested parties, is how does it change a project? How does it alter a project? How do we, you know, make sure that, that this criteria is included 
when we um, when we look at some of these new, particularly larger uh, expansion projects. I, I could have Representative Kraft to come. I believe he's here. Um, you know, may be able to uh, answer that a little bit better. I've been uh, holding off on, uh, on on calling him, but um, it's a good question, Representative Petersburg, and maybe we should have the author of the underlying bill address that. Okay, great. So how typical this is, but we love seeing you, Representative Kraft, and <laughs> we're happy you're here to answer this question. So do you want to take a crack at Representative Petersburg's question? Yeah. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, members, uh, Representative Petersburg. Uh, the question was, is there veto power over a specific? Um, the way this is set up to work is that uh, the MnDOT would look at a capacity expansion project and um, the first effort would be to try to, and if that was going to result in increased emissions, say from increased uses of cars, right, that they would try within the project to mitigate. So maybe it's by adding a bus lane or some uh, active transportation. If they're not able to within that specific project, there's a path where they can then use, uh, look at other projects um, that are in the region or even across the state. So it, it, starts from the premise that we need to reduce emissions. It really is not an option to not reduce them and gives the maximum flexibility to be able to do so. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, and which kind of leads to the question, you know, how do we determine and, and th does this language actually allow for more of those mitigation pieces because sometimes expansion projects are actually uh, the benefit of safety uh, or uh, reducing um, cars at other intersections as well. Uh, not necessarily between that particular one. And so when you take that particular project and identify its emissions and so forth based upon that particular project itself, aren't you precluding the impact that it may have around it and what could be there and whether or not safety is the primary factor in this particular situation rather than emissions? Or are you saying that it always has to be emissions is the goal for us to be dealing with? Representative Kraft. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm Representative Petersburg. Uh, so the, the issue you talked about, about if it improves things at other intersections, that's, that's within the project or within the region. So I believe that would be able to be taken into account. This is for capacity expansion projects. If there's a, a reconstruction or a, something else for, for a safety issue that's not a capacity expansion, this language doesn't apply. Representative Petersburg. Uh, the last question for me, at least in this particular s section, is what do you anticipate as the increased cost for these projects having to go through all this particular assessment? Representative Kraft. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Petersburg, uh, it's, uh, it's a theoretical question that would be dependent on the uh, specific project. I, I anticipate that over time this is a thing that will um, improve and reduce costs in the long term. So. Representative Petersburg. Uh, okay, I guess <laughs> I, I guess we've heard that before where we're just going to add more work to people and all of a sudden it's going to become cheaper. Uh, this particular assessment is not something you just plug into a computer and it's done for you. I mean, you, you've got to do the extra work. You've got to have extra personnel to do that. And depending on how extensive the project is, I, I could see this could add 4 or 5% <laughs> onto the project alone just for this assessment. And so I, I, I wish you well in that project uh, of trying to get it done for no cost, but I disagree there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Farr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I want to focus in on lines 1.12 of the of the um, amendment here. So, because we, we've been talking about highway traffic capacity, but it says or provides grade separation at an intersection. And so I have a couple of these projects, one in the very north end of the district I represent and, and one just north of that where we're looking to do that. And so I, I have some of the same questions I think that Representative Petersburg has. Does this then trump safety? If we're doing this because it's, we're going to make a safer intersection, can, can what we're adding here trump that and we won't put in a safer intersection because somebody in MnDOT finds out that there's a, more gas emissions because of this? Representative Kraft. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Farr, so I, I'm not MnDOT, um, but I would say this is not intended to trump safety. This adds another factor within the uh, analysis of a project. Um, and so I, I don't believe that uh, that's not the intention nor what it would do. 
So which one of these representative Farr. Sorry, Madam Chair, which one of these factors do we give more weight to? Representative uh, Kraft. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, Representative Farr, um, you know, I, I would say there, these are factors within a project. I think uh, MnDOT probably has multiple factors within projects that they deal with today. And so um, I think there would be things that be worked through. So I think we need MnDOT to say how they would actually implement this. Representative Farr. I guess I thought we were telling MnDOT what to do here, not the other way around. But I, I have the same question then. So Chair Hornstein said transportation promotes economic growth. Completely agree. Same question. If, if this is promote, promoting economic growth in the area, is this which which one is a higher factor? Which one is going to trump each other? Uh, Representative Kraft. In the, uh, well, I, I can take that. Maybe I yeah. was. Yep. Uh, thank you, Matt. You know, we have uh, there are a number of programs uh, that MnDOT has. You, you referenced commerce, so we have something called corridors of commerce. Safety is an issue. There's about eight or nine different criteria. Actually, we we amend. We have a representative Torkelson provision here that amends some of the regional balance on on the corridors of commerce bill. But um, we also have a, a, a new uh, initiative around safety, uh, and there's lots of criteria listed. So it's you know there are each project has different weighting factors uh, that MnDOT uses, and so we're simply saying this this should be a factor in, in the weighting. And, um, and I think that's important. And, and you know, these, uh, the criteria we use for funding projects has evolved over time. You know, safety wasn't always an issue. Commerce wasn't always an issue. And so we're, we're adding another one. And, um, but that, we take that on a project by project basis. Um, and MnDOT has multiple criteria. Uh, and so we're just really, I think, in a sense, to represent Kraft's efforts, adding another one. I don't think we're going to ve we're not vetoing any project, uh, but we're acknowledging the fact that that the climate should be a, a, a factor in, in these evaluating some of these projects. That's really the simple answer. Representative Farr. Thank you, Madam Chair. So last last question then. So uh, Chair Cleborn said in her comments earlier, anytime we can save Minnesotans time, that's a good thing. So if we can save Minnesotans time. And we can promote commerce. And we can make a safer intersection. Do you envision any way that this could trump that project? Uh, well, thank you. I, I, first of all, Madam Chair, thanks for naming, I think, three of the key areas of this bill that are important. Um, and, and of course, transit is also a way we save people time as well. Um, you know, again, I don't think that one criteria trumps another. Uh, they're taken collectively and weighted collectively on a project by project basis. That's how MnDOT goes about this. And, you know, look, there's a whole evaluation process, process that goes. You know, you do a corridor study, you do preliminary engineering. Uh, there is a lot of public engagement throughout these processes. Uh, and then, you know, you come up with a, a, a plan to, you know, we, we have this all over the state, the kinds of projects that you're talking about. And, um, and a lot of them are like a turning lane. Right? Um, so many crashes take place, uh, or when uh, lanes go from two to four. Uh, just, we're, we're chock full of these things. But what I want to emphasize, uh, members, is that we're just adding really another criteria among many criteria. And so um, it's important. It's, it's what we have to do in, the, this, in this moment, in the 21st century. And I appreciate Representative Kraft's efforts on this. He's worked with a lot of different stakeholders and will continue to do so. Representative Farr. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I understand we're adding another criteria and, and my main concern is what are we going to do with it? And so I, I, I'm good, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I remember hearing this in state government finance and memory does not necessarily serve me at the moment. Perhaps the chair could clarify. I think that bill is still in possession of the committee. I'm not sure we moved it out, but um, one of my principal concerns is on line 3.5 through 3.8 of this amendment. And it's, it's in my estimation, in my opinion, it is predis predisposing land use studies to being um, suppressed based on some of the expected outcomes of this study, uh, Chair Hornstein. 
So it says land use, including but not limited to residential or other density increases, mixed use development and transit oriented development. So um, residential and mixed use density. Uh, the way I, I heard this in committee was if if it was determined that the way a city were interested in developing land inside of its borders was incongruous with what this is trying to accomplish, that it could be shut down. And I think that's kind of what Representative Farr was just alluding to. Uh, former mayor, and I know there's several former mayors and uh, council members here, uh, this strips away local control of those municipalities by saying, well, if if we don't like the way your land use is proposed in your next comprehensive plan, and Representative Kraft did actually mention uh, having a comp plan, uh, that in your line 3.7, a mitigation action, which means we're going to change your project for you, that's what that means, uh, that's what happens. So this, this is a very wide and encompassing amendment, um, and I don't, I don't remember again seeing any cost in this, so it's policy being added in uh, to the bill here in Ways and Means. Uh, but again, I, I, I am very troubled by uh, line 3.5 through 3.8 that it's, it is setting it up so that um, an organization, Chair Hornstein, much like you and I share some frustration with, that has a lot of heavy handed control that I believe you're going to bring a bill to perhaps change their paradigm, we're now giving an organization, perhaps them or somewhere else, that same level of control to do this greenhouse impact study. So please tell me, Chair Hornstein, that I'm dead wrong on that because I don't believe I am because we did talk about it in state government finance that that is a potential change that could be offered to cities or demanded of cities. Uh, Madam Chair and Rep. Seven Nash, so first of all, just to your first, very first question on process, um, the bill was heard in, uh, and passed through state government, and then we took it back and incorporated it in the bill. So the two committees of jurisdiction have heard this, and um, I'll, I will ask um, Rep. Sam Kraft to uh, address the two lines that you're most interested in bill. hearing from. Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Nash. So. This language, the way this amendment was done, um, in some ways it was kind of a DE on the language that was in there. So uh, the vast majority of this language was in the bill that you heard. Um, there was two parts of that, that language relative to MnDOT and the Met Council portion, the uh, comprehensive plan piece. I think you may be confusing those two. This uh, MnDOT portion has not changed since then um, and does not uh, this is relative to capacity expansion projects um, on high, on the with MnDOT. So, if you have specific other things in this land use language that you'd like to suggest, I'm open to that. And Madam Chair, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I didn't hear a yes or a no to whether or not that the expected outcome would be that land use uh, development could be changed without the cities really having an opportunity to have local control. Oh. And that, and Chair Hornstein, this is ultimately your bill. So I would, yeah. I would love no, no. to hear from I, you. I, 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 I'm happy to answer that. Yeah. So, um, so that's the dis that's the disturbing part, Madam no. Chair, is that a potential outcome seems to be written on the way in uh, that in a a there's a veto power given to uh, somebody that may say to the city of Waconia, where I used to serve as mayor and now represent, or the city of Pick a Place. Uh, because your land use does not conform to our expected outcome, Chair Hornstein, that we're going to now have veto power on that project. I can't take that one, uh, Madam Representative Chair. Um, so uh, similar to the line of questioning we had about, you know, the, the, the possible case of a, of a, a highway um, intersection, um, local control is maintained because the, you, this is just really looking at, again, adding a criteria to a comprehensive planning process. So we're not taking away local comprehensive planning. I think you were the mayor of Waconia, mm -hmm. and so you know how important these comp plans are. And so no one is going to say uh, uh, to usurp the power of, of a local government. Uh, but again, we're just saying that this needs to be part of the mix when you're doing a comprehensive plan. 
And Representative Nash. Lastly, Madam Chair. Well, uh, when I was mayor, there were projects that were told we were told that were not going to be green lighted because they were incongruous with the, the overall plan. So, uh, I, I, my my concern will be maintained. Um, I can guarantee you there will be some amendments on the floor for for this uh, effort. I would expect nothing less, Madam Chair. Uh, but th this is not benign language, Madam Chair, and I would uh, encourage a no vote, and I would request a roll call on this particular amendment. There will be uh, having a roll call requested. There will be a roll call on the A33. Uh, further discussion, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair, and I believe this will be directed towards Representative Kraft. Um, I'm confused. I think my impression was that we were here on a transportation bill, and <clears throat> I, I didn't think we were hearing an environmental bill. My question is, is, is the goal of the Department of Transportation and the Transportation Committee and this bill to provide the safest, cleanest, fastest, best use of taxpayer dollars? Um, or is it an environmental plan? Is, is it the goal of transportation to provide the least what one party considers to be most environmentally tolerable plan that they can get passed without there being um, too much pushback. So which is it? We we either do one or the other. Are we are we doing the best, cleanest use of the dollars, or are we worrying about what we can what we can get passed with with the in, environmental conditions? And and I ask this because if we're going to start talking about looking at miles driven and reduction and all these things, is is that really the job of the state to decide? It's a monopoly, no different than the power company. Um, you have to have your electric provided by one power provider, and then they'll tell you you're using too much electricity for what we feel you should be using. We add all these extra monies, all these measurements. The government's providing a service they monopolize, and then they tell us we're, we can be controlled, or we're gonna you got to cut down on this gas, or we're gonna take further actions. So my question, and I'll re, I'll restate it: Is the goal of the trans is this a transportation bill, or is it an environmental bill? Thank you. I'll take that, uh, Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I I want I wanted to take that. I know you had said. Uh, asked Representative Kraft, but because you had referenced the Transportation Committee and MnDOT and, and the overall <laughs> goals of the bill, um, I wanted to just thank you, first of all, for the question, because it's really all of the above. All of the things that you mentioned are important in transportation, and, and I said those at the, at the top of my presentation. Safety, economic vitality, mobility, equity, and the environment and climate. If transportation is the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions, it needs to be addressed in a transportation bill. So MnDOT has uh, a, um, a whole uh, department, uh, if you will, or a whole a deputy commissioner who's involved in, you know, how do we make transportation more sustainable? It is part and parcel of their work. It cuts across many different government agencies. The governor has a climate cabinet, for example. So the issue of climate really uh, is very intersectional in terms of how uh, we are approaching uh, really one of the, you know, the, the existential crisis of our time, climate change. Uh, and so there is a commitment on the part of every agency, including MnDOT, to address this in one form or another. Uh, and I think it's particularly important in transportation because, as I said before, it is the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions. So, yes, we have a portion of the bill that addresses it. Studies have shown that land use, public transportation, electrification of our infrastructure, uh, and, and elect uh, adoption of electric vehicles are the top three strategies we can use in transportation to address greenhouse gas emissions. We do that in the bill. 
This is the land use portion of that bill. Representative Novotny, do you have a follow-up? Thank you, Chair. And I, I think you're getting at the problem, and that you're restating. I think we agree that this it's more of an environmental bill than transportation. And uh, I'll just end with this. I, when we were starting to build our family, my wife and I would go to, you know, pick out the strollers. And you can go to the baby section and you can pick out the stroller that's also be able to be converted to a walker and an easel. And um, <laughs> I always had the, the saying with her that if it tries to do more than one thing, it does none well. And I think that is my biggest objection with the transportation budget. Um, I, I, we have an environmental committee. We have an environmental section. I think we're not doing anything well. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is there someone here from MnDOT that could um, uh, come to the table um, for a couple of questions? I think um, to Representative Farr's question and, and so forth, I just would like some clarity on, on what, what is a priority in their projects and how, if this amendment goes on and this becomes law, how that list of priorities would be um, affected. Um, I Oh, yes, it looks like we do have somebody from MnDOT. Thank you, sir. If you could just state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Eric Redeen with MnDOT Government Affairs. And um, I think, as was discussed earlier, uh, it's important to, to uh, realize which projects this language would apply to. Uh, so it, there is a definition in the language of, of capacity expansion projects. And so, um, you know, most of the, the work that we do is, is maintaining the existing system, uh, repaving or rehabilitating bridges. Uh, this language would not apply to those types of projects. So for those uh, expansion projects, we would have to go through uh, this analysis and uh, do the... Um, uh, look at uh, projected greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there are ways identified in the bill to, to mitigate. Um, so um, some of those things would be under the department's control. Other, other mitigation elements are under local government control or, or you know, so we, I think, would have to coordinate with, with local governments on, on those uh, mitigation initiatives or transit providers, for example. Um, so it's, um, you know, the, the language is, is something we're still sort of analyzing and, and uh, we would have to figure out how to implement it. To, um, at, at our request, the, the effective date has been pushed out uh, to 2025, so we would have some time to sort of set up a process uh, and, and implement that um, and, and, you know, really um, determine how to, to, to uh, get this new language enacted. Uh, thank you, Mr. Redeem. Uh, Representative Scott, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I sure do. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your, um, I think, very honest answer. Um, basically, you're saying we don't really know how this is going to be implemented, um, what kind of effect it's going to have. But I, I do have concerns like at 1.12 where it says adds highway traffic capacity or provides for grade separation. Um, Highway 10, as you know, um, up in Anoka County um, is a work in progress. And one of the main reasons is um, there's an at-grade problem there because um, we have railroads um, that run parallel to the highway, making it very difficult to get um, emergency vehicles and so forth um, across um, both the highway and then um, the rail separation. So in a project like that, how would you see this, this piece of legislation being overlaid in, in um, as far as a priority? Would the, the number of traffic accidents um, be a heavier weight, or would this be just as heavy a weight or more so? Uh, Mr. Redeem. 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think all of those factors would be, you know, included as we develop a project. And so, you know, projects do have various um, criteria that sort of push them to the top. Certainly traffic safety is one of them. Uh, you know, if, if a project starts as a traffic safety project, but the, um, the proposed alternative is to construct an interchange, then obviously this language would, would kick into effect and we would have to go through this analysis and uh, determine what the impacts of, of the project would, ha you know, would be uh, over the 20 year period on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, and if it was determined that it would lead to increased uh, GHG, then you know, there are the mitigation factors identified um, in the bill that, that we would have to, uh, to work on uh, before the project could proceed. Uh, Representative Scott, one more follow-up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, so so let's say that you know we have this really dangerous great separation issue, and now this is um, law, um, and this would have to be what 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 in this bill would be taken into consideration in a situation like that that would cut that would. Um, that would impact that final project? Um, what kind of things would be done um, if this were to become law to mitigate greenhouse gases in a project like that? Mr. Ridium. Uh, and then, Madam Chair, yeah. and, and if I might, would that add cost to the project from MnDOT's perspective? Mr. Ridium. Um, thank you. So, you know, there are several um, mitigation actions laid out, including, for example, a increased transit service in, um, in the corridor. Um, and so, as I stated earlier, you know, some of those things might be under MnDOT's control. Um, others we would have to work with in the metro area, the Met Council or the local transit provider, for example. Um, so our, our piece of the project might be to construct you know, transit facilities in the corridor, but then the actual transit service would be provided by wherever that local transit uh, provider is in the area. So, um, you know, I think that it kind of remains to be seen what what the impact on projects will be as this is implemented. Um, but it, it's certainly a direction that we're moving already. You know, as, as we go in and do projects, we, uh, we always look at if there are bike ped facilities that can be added to the project if that's you know something that are that's needed in the local area um, transit service would be another thing that we look at so I would say some of these things we're sort of um, trying to implement already uh, as we develop projects thank you mr. Redeem we appreciate you coming up here uh, representative Joachim Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Mr. Rudine. One quick question, too, and it's been a long time since I've been on transportation, but from what I remember in my time on City Council, too, is when you do projects, you already do an environmental impact statement or assessment. Is that accurate? Mr. Rudine. Uh, Madam Chair, yes, that's correct. We are required always to do some sort of environmental analysis, and so, um, you know, sometimes that's an environmental ass assessment worksheet for a smaller type project if it's a large capacity expansion project, we're probably going to do a full-blown environmental impact statement as part of that project development. Representative Joachim. And thank you, um, Madam Chair, and I know you're, I, you are probably more of an expert on greenhouse gas and congestion than I am, but um, just a quick question, does reducing congestion help reduce greenhouse gas? And just to say that this seems like just an expansion or an extension of an environmental impact statement that um, that one would do, Mr. Redeem. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, I think that's, that's true. You know, if if you have significant congestion in a corridor and, and a project will result in reduced congestion, you can actually uh, reduce greenhouse gas <coughs> emissions if if traffic is going from sort of a stop and go condition to uh, you know. 30 miles an hour or, or higher, you can actually um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions because if you're in that stop and go condition, that's usually when vehicles are emitting the most pollution. All right, thank you, Mr. Radium. Uh, Representative Garofalo, you are the last on the list. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Hornstein, um, the 
cost of these assessments? Does this come out of the MnDOT budget? Representative Hornstein. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Garofalo, yes, there is a, um, you know, MnDOT has, um, you know, a whole um, set of uh, steps that they use when they um, assess a, a, a corridor for funding. And, um, and so, yes, there are uh, costs associated with, with, with planning and, and staffing and engineering these projects. And so uh, those, are, those would be coming out of MnDOT's existing budget. Representative Graflow. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Hornstein, does this provision apply to just state highways? Representative Hornstein. Um, this provision, the, the MnDOT specific provisions would, would be in the state system. Right, but Madam Chair and Representative Hornstein, the, when I look at uh, page one, uh, line 10, the definition of a major high pro, um, highway project, it references a section, subdivision, and paragraph of law. Is that um, just for um, trunk highways? I'll, I'll uh, phone a friend here. Um, I, I believe that this would, uh, that uh, section 174.56, Representative Kraft, I don't I have a sense of this, but I want to make sure that I'm accurate. Uh, he's asking is this only for state highway. Representative Kraft, or, or maybe a nonpartisan staff, Chair yeah. Bernstein. It could be, uh, maybe yeah. Mr. Lee will help us with this. Mr. Or Lee, Mr. if you want to come down. I, I would, yeah, I'm not Mr. Burris. off the top of my head yeah, familiar well, with that section of law, but I yeah. believe it's state. But I'd, Mr. Burris. Before we go to Mr. Burris, Madam Chair and Representative Kraft, Shouldn't at a basic level before we're adopting amendment, we should know what highways it's applying to? Shouldn't the author of the bill and the, and the supporter of the amendment know which highways this applies to? Or is that an unrealistic expectation? Representative Graffalo, I think we're going to have Mr. Burris come down and answer the question. Madam Chair, I asked the question. an answer and we're verifying it. And we're getting, we're getting the, the answer Garofalo. for you, okay. Representative Graffalo. I gave the answer, answer right now and we're verifying. The authors, verifying. Don't, the authors yeah. don't know. You know, you know. Right, Madam Chair, the authors don't know, no, right? The authors know, and we're verifying it. Okay. What's Wait a answer? second. Well done. I have the floor. Not okay. Hmm. Representative Garofalo. Yeah, you have the floor. Yes, I'm, I'm saying what you want to, you have a question. Go finish your question. I'm done with my question. All right, well then let's go. Can we get an answer, or is that not allowed under the rules? Well, can, Mr. We get, can, Mr. can we get an answer? I'm going to get you an answer. Perfect. Thank you. Mr. Burris, could you please join us? Mr. Burris, do you want the question restated or are you set to go? Uh, Madam Chair and, and members, uh, Matt Burris with House Research, I think I'm, I think I'm following where the, where the question is. Um, uh, Mr. I, Madam Chair and Mr. Burris, just to be clear, the question was, does this apply to the which highways Excuse this apply Representative to? Representative Graffalo. No. Madam Chair, you I want to make rules sure. here. No. no, I'm restating the question. Yes, when which I highways call on does you, it apply to? you go through the chair. You know this. Okay, Madam Chair, the question is which highways does this apply to? Thank I didn't you. want him to answer the question of whether authors should know the answer to the question or not. So, Mr. Burris. Mr. Burris, thank uh, you. Madam Chair, Representative Graffalo, this would apply to trunk highways with a, um, a project cost estimate. Uh, and that cost estimate amount depends on whether it's in the Metropolitan District or outside. Uh, inside the Metropolitan District, it would be a $15 million mm -hmm. threshold. And outside, uh, so non-Metropolitan, it's a $5 million threshold. Yep. That's the- Representative Graff, oh, go ahead. So, are you done? I think that covers it, yeah. Okay, Representative Graffo, do you uh, have a follow-up? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So it is, uh, in reading that section of law, the 15 and the 5, do we know the origins of why the, why there is this separation of, of triple the project cost requirement in the metro area versus non-metro area? Uh, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Garofalo, my recollection is a bit hazy on when this uh, provision was, was first enacted, but I think it had to do at the time of um, uh, the, the context of that, those cutoffs for when reporting um, was going to be required for, for a new report that was being established. And that's what that, that section of law uh, creates. Um, 
as I recall, uh, that that was viewed at the time as as a uh, a threshold for what kind of information um, would the, the legislature would be interested in in knowing about from a you know what projects to 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 identify as ones that are kind of considered more major from a uh, you know kind of legislative interest standpoint. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Madam Chair. Thank you, and Representative Hornstein. For those projects, I see that we picked out the effective date to 2015. Um, for those projects, 2020, Madam Chair, 2025. Yeah, 2025. I'm sorry. Yes, February 2025. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Hornstein, for those uh, those projects that are already in pre-design or design, would they be exempted from these requirements? Uh, as you know, the lead time in bidding on these is substantially longer than that time frame. Would they be exempted from that, or are they going to have to go back and and retrofit these projects? Chair Hornstein. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Garofalo, no, the, the, um, if, if they're in process, they, they would not be covered under this, uh, this, this is the effective date is 2025. Thank you. So, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Madam Chair, I didn't, didn't mean to haze you in the chair, I just thought it was, well, a, uh, I thought the question Madam was Chair, appropriate. Madam Chair, I want to thank Representative Garofalo, Madam <laughs> Chair. Um, I, I knew that the, this was the state system. I did not know about this 515. So that's very helpful, and thank you for your question. Well, that's what Madam Chair, Representative Horton, that's why I'm here. I'm here to <laughs> Okay. All right. A roll call being Madam requested. Chair. Oh, you have a yes. I, I, I simply want to ask, and I think that, that actually members on both sides of the aisle um, just violated the rule that uh, all members should wait in to be called upon before speaking. And actually, I think in this case, I will note, Unfortunately, both Chair Hornstein and Lee Garofalo in that last exchange uh, did not respect that. And I really would ask members just so we all can follow along. We all respect the rules that we wait to be called upon before speaking every single time. And if I violate that, please uh, stop me as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Pinto. It's like a back and forth here with no chairing. All right. Um, a roll call, I have it being requested on the A3. Um, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Olson. Just to restate, we're voting on the A33, correct? A33. Okay. Aye. Yes. Olson, aye. Vice Chair Edelson? Aye. Edelson, aye. Lead Garofalo? No. N Garofalo, no. Mm -hmm. Representative Acom? Aye. Acom, aye. Representative Egbaje? Aye. Egbaje, aye. Representative Becker Finn? Aye. Becker Finn, mm -hmm. aye. Representative Freiberg? Yes. Freiberg, aye. Representative Gomez? Representative Hassan? Aye. Hassan, aye. Representative Heinzman? No. Heinzman, no. Representative Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Howard? Aye. Howard, aye. Representative Cleborn? Cleborn, aye. Cleborn, aye. Representative Creshaw? No. Creshaw, no. Representative Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Representative Muller? Aye. Muller, aye. Representative Nash? No. Nash, no. Representative Noor? Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Novotny? No. Novotny, no. Representative O'Neill is excused. Representative Pulowski? Representative Petersburg? No. Petersburg, no. Representative Farr? No. Farr, no. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Schumacher? No. Schumacher, no. Representative Scott? No. Scott, no. Representative Joachim? Yes. Joachim, aye. Representative Gomez. Representative Lilly. And Representative Pulowski. Madam Chair, there are 15 ayes, 9 noes, and 4 excused. There being 15 ayes and 1 nay, the motion prevails and the... Oh, 9 nays, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nine nays, and the motion prevails, and the title is agreed to. Or the A33 is it adopted. Thank you, Vice Chair Edelson, for taking over and doing a good job uh, in that moment. So I will trade back my name tag. And I will move the next amendment, which is the A35, or A34, or A34, the A34 amendment. And so I will, or I'll have Representative Hornstein move the A34 amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Um, this is the standard grant management language that we're adding to all the budget bills, and uh, would appreciate your support. 
any discussion to the A34? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A34 is adopted. And um, the next amendment is the A35 amendment. And so Representative Hornstein, would you move the A35 yeah, amendment? The A35 amendment, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the A35 amendment uh, pertains to the delivery fee, which I referenced earlier in my introductory comments. Uh, this is uh, coming out of some conversations I believe we had in the uh, tax committee, just to simply clarify the Department of Revenue's uh, responsibilities. It doesn't uh, at all change the, the structure of the fee. Um, it also, you know, clarifies again, we added some language around small business and small business accounting. So this was, uh, I think, made at the request of members of the tax committee. And so we have that language before us now. Great. Discussion to the A35 amendment. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair, excuse me. Uh, and Mr. Chair, uh, could you more in detail what those, those uh, concerns that the tax committee had that this is correcting? Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Petersburg. I think there was um, uh, issues raised around um, how the Department of Revenue would, uh, you know, be able to implement and account for uh, the fee. Um, particularly, we had uh, an amendment added in the tax committee that um, exempted some of the small businesses. Uh, so that's addressed here in the amendment. Um, and, um, you know, those are the those are really the main items here. Representative Petersburg. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Mr. Chair, um, so the Department of Revenue, did they tell you how, uh, how they were going to be able to be able to track these various changes in small businesses because you've got retailer that has total sales less than a, a million, and then you got 100,000 in previous calendar year. Uh, do they have the capacity and ability to be able to track that information without additional costs? Representative Hornstein. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Petersburg. You know, they did testify briefly uh, in the tax committee. Um, I didn't detect uh, any major impediments to their ability to manage them. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I will uh, talk more about this when we get into final passage, uh, but thank you. Further discussion to the A35. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is the first time I've seen this, but um, Representative Hornstein, is your understanding, because I see a reference here to on page three, lines one and two, metropolitan, there's a definition there for metropolitan area. Is this bill only applicable to deliveries within the metropolitan area? Or may, set, set, set me no, straight on um, that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Scott, thank you for uh, um, flagging that. This, this also, uh, there's some technical issues around the uh, metropolitan sales tax. Uh, and the Department of Revenue's role here. So that is the, those are the sections prior to um, uh, what you're reading on page three. So sorry about that. I appreciate you raising that. Representative Scott. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So this bill does apply statewide. It's not just the metro area. Represent just, yeah, Representative Hornstein. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So the delivery fee is statewide. Uh, the metropolitan area sales tax for transit is the uh, seven county metropolitan area. They're just kind of combined in this particular amendment. Thank you. As it, because it relates again to some implementation issues around the Department of Revenue. So they, they would have yes. jurisdiction over both the, the delivery fee and the metro sales tax. Further discussion, Representative Grapple. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Hornstein, the exemptions 2.15 to 2.28 what was the purpose for those exemptions? What was the intent of them? Representative Hornstein. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Garofalo, um, in, uh, Representative Cagle is the author of the underlying bill and her conversations with uh, some of the business interests that um, uh, contacted her about their concerns of the bill. Um, and here in testimony we heard in committee, uh, some of the smaller businesses felt that uh, uh, this, this would be uh, an appropriate um, uh, addition to the bill and in fact uh, Colorado which has a similar delivery fee uh, did exempt small businesses but only you know uh, as a, after the bill was passed they went back and did this exemption we want to do it at the front end uh, because it's it's reasonable and fair Thank you. Madam representative, Chair, representative Hornstein um, what is the problem it's fixing though 
Representative Hornstein. Um, some, Madam Chair, some of the small businesses felt that there were some um, uh, both accounting uh, issues and um, uh, administrative issues that uh, would be um, potentially problematic. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of the volume of their business, it, it could impact that. Um, we haven't seen evidence of that, but, you know, it is something that, you know, we want to be attentive and uh, responsive to the interests of some of these small businesses. Thank Representative you. Garofalo. Madam Chair, Representative Hornstein, the, uh, the $1 million threshold, is that to exempt a certain percentage of businesses? Is there something about that number? Why, why was the number $1 million chosen? Representative uh, Hornstein. Thank you. I think that was, uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Garofalo. Yes, I think that had to do with a particular threshold. Is there, Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Hornstein. Is there anything about that number? Does, it, does that exempt a certain percentage of businesses? That's why it was chosen. Is there a threshold at which that we think those costs are... Uh, going to be burdensome onto those businesses. I'm just was the number plucked out of thin air. Uh, what 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 are the what are the what is it about the one million dollar number that makes it appropriate? Representative Hornstein. Um, I, I, again, I'm going to phone a friend here. Uh, Representative Cagle is the author of the underlying bill, and I think she can explain that better. Madam Hi. Chair. Hi, Representative Cagle. Welcome to the committee, and I trust you heard the question, so please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Garofalo. It's already in statute that way. Representative Garofalo. Madam Chair, this is a new fee. How is that in statute? <laughs> Representative Cagle. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. The reference to small businesses is already in statute. The Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the definition of, it says the fee imposed by this chapter and the requirements of this chapter do not apply to a retailer that made retail sales totaling less than $1 million in the previous calendar year. So this is a new this is a new sectional law, isn't this on or is this the 168E05? Isn't this new? The, Representative Kegel. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Graffalo. The fee is new. The reference to the one million dollar um, under sales of one million dollars is something I believe that is already in statute under small business, um, working with the tax. Um, uh, nonpartisan staff and also industry. Um, this is kind of where we we landed. Representative Garofalo. Okay. Um, so, Madam Chair, a question for you. So, this amendment was drafted, looks like yesterday at 2.30. Is this amendment subject to an amendment? Um, it's the prerogative of the chair, and you would be offering a verbal amendment right now, is what you're saying? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, you could, if uh, you want to offer a verbal amendment to this bill, and you... Um, let me, let me, yeah. yeah. Why don't you can proceed with authoring, offering a verbal amendment. Okay, so Madam Chair, the question was that because the amendment was stamped at 2.30, usually we have flexibility on that, but we say it was outside of 24 hours, then it shouldn't be subject to an amendment. Just wondering, because this was under 24 hours, if, a per, if I could, you know, I, I look at the million dollar number, that's not adjusted for inflation. I know the DFL has wanted to take inflation into account and a lot of forecasts that perhaps we could index that number going forward. We could make it a bigger number to make sure that the burdens that are being uh, exempted from those under a million, we could expand that to uh, protect others, Representative Hornstein. Representative Garofalo, I think I was pretty clear and we've been pretty flexible and I said you could offer a verbal, so I did answer that question. If you'd like to proceed with a verbal amendment, you can. Thank you. So Madam Chair, Representative Hornstein, so I'm kind of making the case for a potential amendment here. Can we expand that so we have more small businesses that are uh, protected from this fee? Representative Hornstein. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. This is the, uh, the language that uh, the author of the underlying bill uh, prefers and has vetted uh, with many others, and so I would speak against the oral amendment. Okay, well, it isn't an oral, so Re I, Representative I Garofalo, are you going to offer an oral amendment or not? Uh, I'm not going. Now that I know that the highly respected chair of the Transportation Committee uh, does not want to protect additional small businesses, I will not offer that amendment, Madam Chair. Further discussion to the A35 amendment. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. 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 The motion prevails and the A35 amendment is adopted. I believe we are all out of amendments. And so the we have the bill as amended in front of us. So discussion to the bill. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Hornstein, <laughs> there's lots of 
new fees and so forth and expanded fees in this bill. Uh, my question is, I have a 2012 Nissan Altima. Are my tab fees going to go up under this bill? Representative Hornstein. Uh, your tab fees will uh, go up, but at a very small rate because your car is over, is 10 years old uh, uh, approximately. Uh, and um, I don't know when in the year you bought it. But um, we have a much, much uh, lower threshold for uh, tab fee increases for uh, cars of your age. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I, I'm concerned, Representative Hornstein, because um, if this bill is trying to be more equitable to folks that are lower income, um, a lot of folks with lower incomes drive older cars. And I see this as increasing their costs um, going forward. And I, that, that concerns me. I think there are other issues in this bill that are going to also disproportionately hurt people of lower incomes um, because I think there's just going to be so much more expense going into our whole transportation system. And I, I, I wonder, too, Representative Hornstein, which do you think would reduce poverty more, a train line to Duluth or, or reducing bus fares? Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair, Representative Scott. First of all, I just want, I, I wasn't sure exactly when you bought your car. So um, I do want to say if it was, in fact, after 10 years, you're right on that threshold. So if it was after 10 years, you would actually be paying $5 less. So I, I did want to. If it was before 10 years, then you would have a slight increase. So I just wanted to uh, put that on the record. Um, but, um, you know, this is, the, the issue here is that um, all of our transportation systems uh, are covered in this bill, all modes, all parts of the state. And so there are um, certain um, areas in which uh, people of higher income benefit, people of lower income benefit. Uh, there are many people that may not own a car. So they have now an option to go to, to get to Duluth. Um, the pilot project that you referred to, uh, of course, will, will also impact uh, people of lower incomes because we know that uh, when you have lower reduced fares, ridership increases, and people are able to get to their jobs. People are able to do their grocery errands. People are able to get to school. And so, again, I think that the word I would use to describe this bill is comprehensive. It is statewide. Every Minnesotan will benefit. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, again, um, I, I think there are a lot of fees in here that are, are disproportionately going to hurt people of, of um, low income. Just the delivery... Um, the delivery fee alone of 75 cents. I'm wondering, Madam Chair, um, Representative Hornstein, I don't know if you need to ask the author of that bill or not, but how did you arrive at 75 cents, which is the highest delivery um, fee in the nation at this point? Representative Hornstein. Madam Chair, um, uh, Representative Scott, I think that the uh, fee was arrived at by really looking at some of the needs that we have in our transportation system. And uh, we have significant needs here in Minnesota. We have the fifth largest road system in the country. That's not per capita. That's in miles. As I said at the beginning, it is deteriorating uh, because we have not made the necessary investments. So we're calibrating this based on how we can get to the need uh, to address this, this growing and significant issue. And I'll also add, since we're talking about the delivery fee, you know, there's a lot of concern about the 75 cents. You know, there are a lot of uh, entities now that are charging so much more than that for delivery. You know, hy V Lunds, I've got a whole list here, uh, which I can share with you. But hy V, for example, many of these deliveries set their fee at $9.95. So this is something that people are paying for. Uh, and I, I'm not going to guess at the accounting that the, the grocery industry does, uh, but they're already paying almost $10 for 
per delivery, we're adding 75 cents for our road and bridge infrastructure. So that's, again, people will be impacted, yes, but they're already spending ex a lot of money. Uh, and, I, you know, DoorDash, all sorts of fees already imposed. So we're just simply adding this because it is a growing source of revenue. We had heard so many concerns about the, the gas tax. Uh, this is why we have the delivery fee, and I think this is the future. And this is something we can get behind. People are already paying for this. Uh, uh, and uh, again, this modest uh, uh, allocation for our roads and bridges will go a long way in solving our transportation problem. Representative uh, th Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate your explanation, Representative Hornstein. Um, people have a choice whether to shop at Hy-Vee and pay that fee or not. Um, they're not going to have a choice on a government-imposed fee whatsoever. Um, uh, a person could obviously drive to Hy-Vee for cheaper, most likely, um, or just lo their local grocery store, and then they wouldn't be paying that fee. But if, if they if they want to order something from Amazon from far, far away, then it's going to it's going to cost them. But um, Representative Horstein, I, you know, like and respect you, you know that, and um, I just think this is a, a wrong, a wrong approach to um, transportation. I think it's just, it's, uh, there's no restraint in it, and that causes me concern. Thank you. Representative Petersburg. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, uh, Chair Hornstein. You know, uh, I've worked with you for many years now, and you and I share the same passion for transportation, and I think we also share the same passion for additional funding for our roads and bridges. Uh, I think that's that, that funding is con kind of also where we start d deferring uh, into um, where the money comes from. But, um, Madam Chair, if I could ask uh, somebody from Met Council to come forward for some questions, uh, over half of these new dollars uh, tax increases are going to Met Council, and I think it's important for us to know, you know, what the plan is for those that is not real clear in the bill. So if somebody from Met Council could come forward, I'd sure appreciate answering a few questions. Great. It looks like we have someone coming Hi. forward here. Hi. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Judd Shetnan. I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Metropolitan Council. So thanks for having me this morning. Great. Representative Petersburg. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Mr. Shetnan, uh, so, so when the Met Council uh, asked for this um, uh, three-quarters of a percent sales tax, what, what plans did you have? What were the deficiencies that you needed to fulfill with this, um, these new taxes? Mr. Shetnan. Well, uh, Madam Chair and members, um, and uh, Representative Petersburg, uh, just to be clear that the Metropolitan Council has a, a recommendation of a one eighth cent sales tax uh, for the metro area for transit. Uh, that is the governor's recommendation. Uh, the governor has mentioned that he is open to discussing a larger amount. Um, and so uh, to be clear that, um, that we are, are moving forward with a one eighth cent sales tax. But as far as what, um, what we're trying to address here, we have a uh, existing structural deficit that has um, that has existed in, in the transit system in the metro area for, for many, many years. And uh, one of the things that I appreciate about uh, Representative Hornstein and his bill is that this um, uh, uh, funding will allow us to begin to address, address that structural deficit. Um, I would be happy to let uh, Representative Hornstein speak to how, how the funding will be spent in his bill, but on the bottom of page 59, the top of page 60, there is a list of, of uh, basically a menu of items that we have to spend uh, these funds on uh, related to the transit system. And it's all from the, uh, for uh, the e-bus system to replace transit shelters for capital operating funds related to the ABRT system. Uh, so there's a, a long list of, of items that can be, or that, that need to be uh, funded uh, with a portion of the sales tax on an annual basis. So hopefully that helps answer your question, Representative Petersburg. Representative Petersburg. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and that's uh, that's getting there. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, also, in regards to that, we know that uh, this particular uh, new spending in this bill, uh, Department of Public Safety is going to have somewhere around 150 to 160 new FTEs. Uh, the Department of uh, Transportation is 146 to 173, depending on the year. And it's been difficult getting out some numbers 
I think just, just within the last few hours, uh, there has been some uh, indication from the Met Council staff that could be as little as 30 FTEs with all this new dollars. Do you have any updated figures for us on how many FTEs this, these new dollars will be generating? Uh, Mr. Shutnan. Uh, Madam Chair and, uh, and members and Representative Petersburg, um, we did have a conversation with, uh, with uh, Andy Lee, a uh, fiscal analyst about this, and, and I'm just going to, um, to start with uh, talking a little bit again about our structural deficit. So we, and then I'll get to your question. So we have a, uh, we know uh, nearly a $300 million structural deficit uh, in our transit system beginning in fiscal years 26 and 27. That will, be, it will continue to grow into the future. And so we know that if these funds were to pass that we would be using those funds just to fund our existing system as it is. Uh, and then we get to the list of items that are, uh, that we have to use a portion of the sales tax on, on an annual basis. Well, there are both operating costs there and there are uh, capital costs there, so um, it's very difficult to prescribe a specific number to how we would be, uh, how many FTEs we would be adding based on that. And so I'm not trying to be elusive here, but I'm also trying not to speculate. And I would say that when we look at ABRT lines, that we um, generally would be adding uh, staffing of in the in the one to two dozen because ABRT lines replace uh, oftentimes where existing services. Uh, but there are a number of things that can that are can be done here. And there's also funding for the um, for the suburban transit providers. And I don't want to speak uh, to how they would be uh, spending those funds and how many FTEs they would have. But uh, the 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 how the bill uh, lists what the funds can be used for, uh, since it does say that it can be used for both capital and operating, again, it is, I, I don't want to speculate. And, uh, but we do know that we would be using it for uh, many of those purposes here. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I think I have three questions for Mr. Shetnan uh, left. Uh, one is around that very question. What, uh, do you have a, a ballpark figure on how much of the dollars that will be coming your way are more, more discretionary versus uh, uh, specific? Mr. Shetnan. Well, uh, Madam Chair and members, the, the way that the bill reads, it really does speak to um, having to use a portion of these funds on the 11 items that are listed on the top of page 60. And so, but, it, but on the bottom of page 29, it says it is not limited to those, uh, to those 11, but we must use it for those. Um, again, I want to just add that, that um, I think it may be uh, better for Representative Hornstein to maybe speak to some of that, but we would absolutely follow the law and use it on these pur for these purposes. But I also want to restate that a large portion of this will be going to address our structural deficit and a fiscal cliff that we've been talking about uh, with the legislature for many years, and that will be uh, where the first call will go in order to really be able to stabilize uh, the system that we have currently. So, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Petersburg, I am, I, I know you're looking for some specificity here. I, am, I apologize, I'm not able to provide that, but the way that this is written in a way that it provides for other, multiple ways for it to be funded, it's just really difficult to be able to give you a hard and fast number on that. Representative Petersburg. Thank you. Um, uh, the next question revolves around uh, the funding for construction and others. Uh, this bill actually gives uh, Met Council, which is an unelected body, the ability to bond with those new dollars. Uh, what, is, what is the council's um, plans for, for bonding? Uh, what kind of debt service are they planning on doing? Uh, uh, what could, could you enlighten us with that? Because that seems a kind of a dangerous premise. Mr. Shetnan. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, Representative Petersburg, uh, we are just going through the legislative process here and working uh, with the legislature on this. I can tell you the council hasn't made any plans on how we intend to finance uh, using any of these sales tax funds up until we are in a position to be able to, um, that, to have these funds available. Uh, we are in the process where obviously the House is bringing forward their bill, the Senate's bringing forward their bill, and the governor has his position. And we look forward to working with uh, Chair Hornstein and uh, Senator Dibble in order to, uh, to land a uh, transportation funding bill. But um, 
we are not getting out in front of ourselves and uh, made any determination on how we are going to finance uh, with any of the potential new revenue that's provided in this bill. Okay. Representative Petersburg. Thank you. And the last question that I have for, for the Met Council is, is, you know, I'm aware that there are a lot of studies going out there. And one of them that I've just made aware of indicates that uh, Minneapolis uh, metro area is looking at the largest business vacancy around for major, major cities, which kind of indicates that there is a change in people's behavior in regards to transit and some of the other things. Uh, how is that going to be impacting some of the plans that, that the Met Council might have with some of these funding? Because it seems like maybe um, we're putting in more dollars into something that may need to change into the future and maybe we are got the cart before the horse. Mr. Shetnan. Well, Madam Chair and members and Representative Petersburg, thank you for the questions. Um, I will say that uh, uh, the transit system has been impacted uh, by the pandemic, uh, but one thing I would like to share is that we do know that our, our ABRT system, arterial BRT and local service has been the most resilient uh, of any of the service and as well as Metro Mobility um, of any of the service. So when we see transit uh, services rebounding, we really do uh, see that those investments are paying off. Uh, this bill uh, directs us to use uh, um, a, a portion of those funds on ABRT investments. And, uh, and I appreciate Representative uh, Hornstein has always been a, a great um, leader when it comes to investing in our ABRT systems. And that's what we intend to do. Um, I can't speak to um, uh, what's what is happening as far as uh, in, in the city of Minneapolis, I'm, I'm the wrong person for that. But, but we do know that our transit system is still necessary. We need to grow it. We need to invest in it. And, uh, and I know that the council is very interested in that and that the governor with his proposal is interested in that. And, uh, and I'll let Representative Hornstein speak to his bill. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't think I have any more questions for for the Met Council. I do have a few more questions on the bill if you want me to continue with that. Oh, or, sounds great, Representative Petersburg. We have about 25 minutes left. All right, thank you. Um, the next question revolves around the delivery tax. And and I think, um, uh, Mr. Chair, you talked about, well, these other people are, are charging $9.95 for uh, delivery charge and so forth. Um, but unless I'm wrong, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that $9.95 also includes gasoline taxes, license tab fees, other things that they must also have to pay that goes towards roads and bridges. And so there is already some fee for um, the roads and bridges that are coming out of that 995, and now we're adding the other 75 uh, cents. Is that your recollection, or do you think they're not paying those other fees? Representative Hornstein. Thank you. Well, actually, for high V, it's 1995 if you want quicker delivery. But... Um, <laughs> You know, the, the issue here is that, um, you know, there are certainly, you're, you're, Madam, Madam Chair and Representative Petersburg, you're absolutely correct. Uh, they, they pay a license tab fee for whatever vehicle they uh, are using. They have to fill it up with gas. So there are expenses. You know, I don't know the accounting. I don't know what kind of cost center or profit center this is for these various um, entities. Obviously, they're making money because they wouldn't be doing it otherwise. It's not a service. Um, so I don't, I can't, I don't know how much of this is uh, uh, staff costs versus, uh, you know, gasoline, et cetera. Um, but you know, there is a there is a, a profit in providing the service, um, and the delivery fee is something people could control, you know, versus the gas tax. <laughs> Um, that's one reason why I think we're, we're looking at this new um, innovative uh, system here, um, uh, because you know they, they can they can um, package. Uh, Representative Kegel talked about at the hearing that you can uh, order more than one item at a time, for example, right? And so um, you know I I think again uh, this is going to impact people, but. They are, we are paying already, you know, uh, a flat rate of $9.99 a Target. Um, Whole Foods is $9.95. So people are already paying $10, and we're paying that additional amount of money because this is a transportation expense. There's a transportation nexus in delivery. And so this makes sense, I think, for many standpoints. Um, it is an important new source of funding that we're going to use, and it's going to 
impact. It's going to help our roads. It's going to make our bridges safer. We have hundreds of hundreds of fracture critical bridges, even after the Section 152 uh, legislation that we passed in 2008. So let's really focus on what this is buying us. And I think this is a way that, that we can do this in a, 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 a new and innovative way that will um, that will get the job done. Representative Petersburg. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so for the rest of the committee, I'll, uh, the, the bill started out with 45 cent tax or delivery fee, and then it went to 75 percent or 75 cent delivery fee, and that included everybody, including the small businesses. And now, as you heard in the amendment, it small business was kind of taken out of that whole picture of, of this piece. So there's been a lot of moving parts with this and the amount of dollars raised. I know that Colorado, that this has been uh, made after, uh, has some issues with it too that's going through. And so I'm, I'm guessing we're going to have a lot of work dealing with this in, into the future. It's an extremely regressive tax that I think is is something that we don't consider. Uh, by the way, uh, you will now be paying the 75 cents on clothing, even though you're not paying sales tax on it. So, uh, you know, that's that's one of those things that, that that's a concern. Uh, going on to, to the next issue that I think has, has some real concern is is what we're doing with passenger rail. Uh, as, as Mr. Chair had mentioned, um, we are needing to ha invest in this train to Duluth uh, because we can get hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government. And I want to caution us a little bit about chasing after federal dollars, and I need to go no further than just talk about uh, the special ed subsidy uh, program through education, in which now we're dealing with the cross-subsidy issue because we ch chased after those federal dollars. And, and this is another example where the Duluth train, the dollars we're chasing after is building it out, not the subsidy after it's been built. And so it's, it's a concern for me that we are, that we're trying to find these dollars for building it, but we still haven't figured out any way of limiting our exposure and risk for the uh, 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 building expense as well. In, in regards to that, we have an additional um, train analysis um, by a, um, a group that is going to be task force that's going to be in, including going out to Fargo, Nor um, Moorhead area from Minneapolis, St. Paul. And underneath that, it's going to have the North Star commuter rail as, as part of its discussion. However, uh, attempts to make that a little bit more realistic uh, failed in transportation uh, because that North Star, um, the only thing that the committee can discuss is whether you enhance it or maintain it. And I think there should have also been an opportunity for them to have determined whether or not it should be eliminated, especially if you're going to continue uh, the train all the way out to Margot Forehead, Moorhead. You probably don't need to have both trains going, but that was not uh, added to the, the bill, which I think was a, a big mistake. Uh, because um, if you don't put all the cards on the table, and you exclude some of them from being looked at, sometimes you miss a great opportunity, which I think is something that we have here. The last issue that I want to talk about this bill is just in regards to some of the, the greenhouse uh, Met Council climate action planning requirements, et cetera, that are in this bill that are really um, going to become overbearing. Uh, there are going to be cities and, and townships that are going to have to put in uh, hundreds and thousands of dollars in order to provide some of these particular action plan requirements for the Met Council uh, that may or may not have any direct impact into, into the air quality itself. And even more so when it comes to uh, land management in which now uh, some entity other than the city may be involved in developing how you're gonna use your own land within, in, within the city. Those are all issues, and, and there'll be more that we'll be talking about on the floor, of course. Uh, but for all of those reasons, uh, I, this bill is not one that I can support at this time. I think there are ma too many issues, and I will rely on to others to talk more about it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Chair, excuse me. Representative Novotny. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if Mr. Stepman from uh, Met Council can head back down, uh, I believe we'll have to, just a couple questions. Uh, Representative Petersburg covered it very well, but I just have specific questions about the North Star line. 
you mentioned that you have existing structural deficits. How much of that is from North Star? Mr. Shetnan. Uh, Madam Chair and members and uh, representative, we, I, I will have to provide that to you. I will say that um, um, we have been funding our structural deficits in the last, uh, in fiscal years 20, two, 21 and 22 and 23 and 24 uh, through uh, federal funds that we have received, uh, COVID related funds. But uh, uh, we do have a structural deficit that is in both our bus and rail and, uh, and in Metro mobility. But I can, I can get that for you very quickly. I just don't have it off the top of my head. I apologize. Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair. And uh, last question for you, Mr. Stemmen. Any idea what the what the recovery rate or the I believe they call it the pay box rate for North Star is right now? Mr. Shetnan. Uh, Madam Chair and members, I do. Um, we have. Uh, I would say and I mentioned earlier that the transit system has really taken it uh, hard uh, since the pandemic, and the North Star service in particular has suffered um, uh, terribly. And <coughs> we are the fare box recovery on the uh, on the North Star line is I have the numbers are the what have been um, audited uh, are at 2% uh, right now. So it is extremely low. Um, we we were at 16% back in 2017, 16% in 2018. 15% in 2019, and then when the uh, pandemic hit, we dropped to 3% in 2020 and 2% in 2021. Representative Novotny. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stepman. And uh, Chair Hortstein, you had mentioned that, you know, these private businesses wouldn't do it if there wasn't a profit in it. Um, and I'm gonna tie it together with your previous statement about environment we need to do things that are environmentally friendly we are we are running a huge diesel train that is empty I've got the numbers for February North Star in front of me 309 rides a day that's both ways 105 persons a day are using that train for two trips two trips a day that's 50 people a train instead of taking a large diesel powered locomotive back and forth to Minneapolis, um, I, I would, is there any appetite for just sticking a fork in North Star and being done with that and replace it with uh, a flexible, heck you could even go electric buses the, for <laughs> a fraction of the cost and that would, that would help with your global environmental goals and save millions and millions of dollars. Representative Hornstein. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair um, and uh, Representative Novotny. I mean, yeah, I, look, uh, the, the, I, I think there are, I will certainly agree with you that there's problems with North Star and, and ridership. Some of it's pandemic related. Much of it, of course, is pandemic related. Um, but I think that um, we also have, I, I think there was a very poor planning decision made when this, when this, uh, uh, corridor was um, constructed and to, to have it not go to St. Cloud I think was a, a huge huge mistake and error and um, I, I think that uh, you know one of the provisions that we're looking at in this bill is you know how do we correct that error um, I think that there would be significant uh, changes in ridership patterns if we had if we had um, completed that that line to St. Cloud representative Novotny Thank you, Chair. And Representative Hornstein, I used to sit and watch the, the bus from St. Cloud unload at the Big Lake Station pre-pandemic. And even then, four, maybe five people would get off on a good day. And we were running a large coach bus to go back and forth. And not only that, we had to have two of them um, going back and forth um, when they easily could have made the trip with one. We've got the coach buses, the infrastructure's there when you're in a hole, quit digging. Uh, there, <laughs> we can do this much better, much cheaper, and thank you. Further discussion to the bill. Lead Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Hornstein. Um, well, I look at your bill and I see a Bermuda Triangle of boondoggles, Representative. 
Arnstein, we see uh, that you're choosing to replace the existing transit from Minneapolis to, to Duluth with a fixed rail train. Uh, despite the fact that we have right now a uh, demonstrated failure, I didn't realize, Representative Navani, thank you for saying that, I didn't realize the fare box recovery for North Star was 2%. I knew it was bad. I didn't realize it was 2% uh, bad. Um, so we have the, prov the proven failure of the North Star corridor, and in predictable fashion, we see that um, no one admits they're wrong. Uh, the focus is instead on, we just haven't spent enough money. Uh, we just haven't put enough money into it. So we've got the, the North Star commuter rail failing. We have the train to Duluth, which will fail. I did some research and tried to find another fixed rail commuter rail system anywhere in the world with a population that small on one end, and I couldn't find one. Uh, the, Duluth metro, the Duluth region is a little over 80,000 people. I couldn't find a, a fixed rail train. Is that right, Madam Chair? Do my numbers? Representative Garofalo, I think the larger Duluth metro is slightly bigger, but we don't have to okay, thank you. pull over that. Um, Representative Garofalo. I always respond to Representative Hornstein scowls. So <laughs> the, we have that going on. The Southwest Light Rail project, which is now the most expensive public works project in Minnesota history is obsolete before it's even completed. Uh, one of the hubs on there has already been vacated, a place that was supposed to be uh, one of the hubs for commuting, for workers, going to location. It's already been abandoned. Um, we have huge multi-billion dollar fixed rail costs being built into the system. And those are all being paid for. Those are all taken care of. But if we want to take care of our roads, if we want to expand our roads, we want to get those engineering uh, grades improved, we're told we have to raise taxes. And with a $17.5 billion surplus, I don't think we need to raise taxes to be doing the essential things in government. And so I'll be voting no on your bill, Representative Hornstein. I'm hoping that at some point in the process we have some moderation in terms of the tax increases that are being levied, uh, in terms of the increased costs, in terms of Things like the lid on I-94 that is just a, a boondoggle and waiting. I'm, I'm hoping, Representative Hornstein, we can appeal to your senses or we get some legislators to uh, stop what are ongoing costs to a series of boondoggles, and I'll be voting no. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, I'll go to Representative Hornstein to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, this, we always have a good, uh, robust transportation discussion. There are really good questions raised uh, on the other side of the aisle. Um, I want to thank Representative Petersburg uh, for being uh, such a, a wonderful presence throughout this uh, session uh, as the Republican lead. And while we disagree on uh, certain issues, there's many that we agree on. And uh, he's been very, very helpful, uh, particularly on um, process issues and we have great communication and I appreciate your partnership so much, Representative Petersburg. Um, and, and good questions were raised, I think, uh, uh, here. Um, I just wanted to comment on um, the, the idea of re regressivity here. And at the end of the day, Madam Chair and members, transportation is about people, right? So what's regressive? Someone who is with a disability on a cold winter day waiting for a bus that doesn't come, that's regressive. What about uh, someone who, uh, like a, a friend of mine, Rachel, from Northeast Minneapolis, who hit a pothole uh, on the way to work and now has to pay $1,000 to repair her car? That's regressive. And I am getting more and more stories about people getting flat tires and front end alignments because of the condition of our roads. Yeah. They're paying something very regressive to fix their cars. What about the frontline worker that works at the airport that has to get up at four in the morning, take two buses and a train to get to work three hours later? Representative, uh, I think it was Representative Novotny, maybe Rep Representative Farr had talked about the need, the, the, how we have to build a transportation system where people can get to where they want to go quickly, right? We don't have that in many instances. And what about the safety issues? What about the 400 people that lost their lives last year on our roads in Minnesota, which we address in this bill? That's regressive. So members, we have a historic opportunity to match not only federal money, but to correct a wrong that has 
festered for 30 years when we have not put in new revenue into this system. General fund transfer alone won't do the job. So we have a variety of different funding sources to move us forward. We have been kicking the can down a pothole-filled road <laughs> for way too long. This bill is transformative. It moves our state forward. All modes, all parts of the state. We didn't even talk about the fact that we fund small cities for the first time with dedicated revenue in this <coughs> bill. If you are, live in a city of 5,000 or less, you're going to be really taken care of by this bill. All modes, all parts of the state. Members, please vote yes to finally move us forward in transportation in Minnesota. Thank you very much, Representative Hornstein. And with that, Representative Hornstein renews his motion that House File 2887, as amended, be placed on the General Register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. no. The motion prevails in House File 2887, as amended, has been placed on the General Register. And we have no further business, but we'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>